This one is on music composition, live performance, and live coding, and web audio in this, uh, this context. Um, we have 50 minutes presentations and 5 minutes questions. I think the presenters are all aware of that. Um, please use the Slack channel if you, if you want, but uh, there will be someone running around with a mic as well for the questions. Uh, the first uh, presentation is called Composing Spatial Music with Web Audio and the Web VR by Cam Chakmak. Is that Cam uh, Jam. Jam. And Rob Hamilton from Rensselaer Polytechnic uh, Institute. So, here you go. Hi, I'm Rob Hamilton. Uh, just as we do with pitch rhythm and timbre. 
Uh, the performances, such performances are quite distinct and unique because every, every, every uh, setup uh, differs uh, slightly and uh, they're quite um, hard to replicate and few people actually go inside the room and actually experience the full thing. So the practice, uh, although it has a, a big history behind it, it's still uh, sort of a niche because of its experimental nature and also how much funding it requires to build these kinds of setups and actually manage everything. So it depends on a lot of institutional uh, funding and patronage. So recreating past works is also a challenge. Uh, we usually talk about them but not actually experience them and it's, uh, there are projects that undertake some kind of uh, reconstruction of previous works but they're usually not feasible. And the overarching question for the research is basically how can we, how can body technologies level this playground for composing, producing, and uh, sharing spatial music? So we believe web audio and web VR technologies can make spatial works more accessible and more inclusive for composers and uh, audiences. Just a little bit of history: spatial approaches to electronic music have uh, been around since people could pick up a loudspeaker and move it around in the room basically and uh, overall there are two different, uh, we can identify two different traditions and two different approaches in sound diffusion in multi-channel uh, com uh, compositions uh, idealist and realist approaches where idealist approach is basically trying to convey a composer's intentions as precisely as possible to the audience and uh, this precision usually requires the, the, the listener to be in an exact spot, a sweet spot, as it's uh, called. And um, ambisonic systems, uh, like you can see here, this. Ambisonic setups usually go on this idealist tradition where they're trying to capture and recreate a spherical sound field as accurately as possible. The higher order ambisonic, uh, ambisonics uh, provide more clarity, more. Um, resolution and um, but it's um, well one of the problems is you can only be listening from one exact location your head needs to be placed in an exact location to get the real effect and the other tradition is a realist approach and um, the realist uh, approach to composing multi-channel electronic music is basically um, accepting these differences in experience and, uh, for the audience due to a variety of factors this could be the way where you're sitting in the room, um, the architecture of the space, or uh, external disruptions. These are, and the realist approach is to incorporate all of these in the piece as it's uh, unavoidable. Uh, one example I'd like to give is uh, kind of a personal favorite, so I just wanted to talk about that for a second. The uh, Persepolis by Zanakis is um, a multi channel uh, composition. And uh, it's actually much more than just a music composition. It's, uh, it includes lights, lasers, uh, children running around or over hills with torches and so on. And it's uh, placed in an archaeological site of the same name um, located in Iran. And, um, well, so they tell me, you know, I've never seen it or I've never really experienced it. And um, we often mention these kinds of examples, but uh, we don't really know uh, very few people actually have been there and actually experienced the thing that the composer really intended to present. So we kind of, uh, as we talk more and more about these things, we sort of uh, have the tendency to mythify them, and um, which draws the conversation away from a directly musical one to more of a more of a critical discussion. So spatial compositions are quite ephemeral in that sense, where you set something up, very, uh, set up a very complicated system, and you. You perform it and then you take it down and it's hard to reconstruct again. Another approach uh, could be uh, acousmonium. Acousmoniums are basically asymmetrical distribution of speakers compared to Amazonics, which is very precise. Uh, acousmonium uh, try to uh, combine loudspeakers that vary in size and shape, uh, quality of response, and try to function them together and showcase something <coughs> that's not only auditory but also kind of uh, presents a visual uh, novelty as well. Uh, for the context of this project, my objectives were basically bringing together a number of technolo contemporary technologies together to compose and present this spatial music piece, and um, place all listeners and uh, place of placing all listeners in that idealized sweet spot, which is naturally possible in a virtual world, a virtual space. In a virtual space, we can place everyone in the sweet spot, so that kind of levels everything. 
And uh, finally, I wanted to capture a spherical 360 video of a physical site that's difficult to visit and um, further augment its immersive qualities and uh, using VR and ultrasonic production techniques. Uh, Omnitone, I wanted to talk about the tools I use. Uh, Omnitone is the primary tool for uh, ambisonic deco uh, decoding, which is a binaural on the web. And uh, as you can see from the figure here, we can, we can decode up to third order ambisonic streams. And we basically point to a file and uh, create an off audio buffer source node, uh, which, uh, which we pass a WAV file through, 16 channel WAV file we send in this case. And, um, that is sent to the high order ambisonic renderer, which uses web audio native convolver and gain node interfaces. Um, and the HOA renderer sort of uh, gets information from a rotation matrix, which could be a sensor data or some interaction, or in, the, in our case, it's the camera rotation data from A frame. And uh, what is A frame? A frame is a 3JS framework for high level VR development. And um, it has an entity component structure, which is usually more, um, more, of a, more of a case in game development and interaction design. But basically, you sort of construct your components and attach it to other pieces, uh, other entities. And in our case, we just needed to wrap a 360 video and uh, make sure we can move around it and ensure it's compatible across browsers and VR headsets and so on. So A-Frame is useful in, in that sense. And uh, for, the co for composing the ambisonic environment, I use SPAP. And uh, SPAP is a library of real-time stabilization tools for Macs. It provides a 3D environment for composition, and the uh, fifth version implements OSC messaging, which is very useful for communicating with other programs and so on. And for the physical space, I wanted to bring, bring in an introduce into the virtual space, I use um, a tech lab called uh, Cray Lab. Cray Lab is an immersive laboratory for uh, with a 360, uh, 360 screen, the shape in the shape of a rounded rectangle we can see from above here. And uh, it has a panoramic screen, along the back of the screen we see an array of speakers and above the, on, on the ceiling there are additional speakers. These are for wave field synthesis and ambisonic support. And it's located in a tech park that not many people can visit. And uh, we have architectural classes in there, some performances, network performances, and so on. But um, its main function is to reconstruct real world places in that, in that place and sort of uh, try out architectural designs on, the, on, the, on, a, real, uh, on a real site and uh, try to see how that, how that works. This is what the architecture students do mostly. And our goal was to export Crayla out, and so instead of bringing a physical site in Crayla, we wanted to take it out and uh, put it in a virtual space where people can experience it. To do this, we uh, used GoPro Omni camera, camera rig and placed it in a sweet spot, which is equidistant from everywhere, but right in the center, and uh, recorded the footage of uh, a footage playing on the screen, and then using. Uh, Effects, um, effects plugins called Mantra VR, we sort of extended that screen in a spherical shape instead of a panoramic one. So the composition process involves navigating through these different environments and uh, the ambisonic scene is composed in Max and uh, encoded in encoded ambisonic and put out. And um, the, I have different versions of compositions, but uh, mainly it's uh, the, it's about it's around 20, 20 sound sources placed around the listener's head, and uh, it's in a double cathedral shape, very regular one, and um, head rotation. So the sound sources are almost identical, and they differ by phase and um, and pitch. So as you rotate your head, the intention is to uh, cause the, cause the sound world to become more active since the proximity of the sound sources change and the slight uh, you get these slight wobbles and uh, pitch changes and so on. So it kind of encourages you to explore and move around, move around. And um, extending the grave screen, the first idea was to place reflective surfaces and mirrors around the screen, as you can see here. And then we sort of took that to a virtual place where we use like virtual mirrors to uh, reflect the footage on the screen, record the footage on the screen, and uh, extend it into expand it above and below the screen as well. And this is the this is sort of like a retrospective uh, composition workflow that I, I took out so we can see 
the audio visual design processes are quite different, but at the end they kind of sync together uh, between A frame and Omnitone, and that sort of becomes a piece. Uh, there are some discussion points that I can throw out, but uh, if you have any questions, I would also be into discussing those because these are also in the paper. But I really want to show you the piece. I can't do it. Uh, I have sound. Bring, can you change the sound source over there? Thank you. So that's the. Just that's it. Okay. You have know, something as well. But. Um, Want to try a different adapter? I don't know. This, this changed a lot. I don't know what's going on. But yeah, if uh, you have any questions or comments, uh, we can sort of discuss some things you want to bring up. Brilliant. Thank you very much. <coughs> so, <laughs> yeah, let's take questions. Are there any? So, I, I would be interested in asking about the. Yes. the, the Spatial audio library that you use, and if there are many competing with audio spatial libraries, and if there is there a lot a of few. collaboration yeah. between people trying maybe to come up with a standard. Yes, um, I in in my case, which is documenting and sharing spatial or electronic music, I think there are a number of uh, there are other ones. I, I just use Omnitone because it was the you know I'm, it was the easiest and simplest uh, just on the go kind of thing. But uh, there are other examples. Um, it's still, it's still in the works. Uh, people are. I, I see different people putting out different uh, kinds of high-order ambisonic rendering on the web. And but um, I think the main the main thing is in streaming high-order ambisonics. Right now we can stream. I think YouTube uh, VR uh, players stream first-order ambisonics, and also OBS uh, OBS also streams first-order. But above that, we don't have anything. Streaming ambisonics would also take a, take a load off the loading times and performance issues and so on. So I think in a, in a couple of years, I think we'll have more options. And, and do you find that there's a standard emerging that people will settle on? Or? Uh, in terms of libraries? Yeah. Um, I can't really say. I'm Things might change, but web audio-based uh, decoding seems to be working very well right now. And I think uh, taking the web audio-based uh, libraries <coughs> would be the way to go. Mm -hmm. 
We have a question here. Yes. <laughs> That's much more important. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure I'm perfectly understanding the technologies involved, but I, I was wondering, so it sounds like you're doing this in two different spaces, one using Omnitone to render, another using SPAT5 in these wave yeah. field and, and, yeah. and high density arrays, and I was wondering if you could talk about the differences in experiences that people have using the, the binaural setups versus um, those giant loudspeaker arrays. Yeah. So, in terms of localization, binaural is actually not so perfect. There are, there are ways you can improve binaural audio. You can individualize your HRTFs and so on, but actual speaker setups would give you a much better, local, much better sense of localizing sounds. But, uh, like I said, setting those up is kind of, you need, a, you need a group of people. It's a management issue. And compared to, uh, compared to that, binaural is much more on the go, and you can do it um, without so much budget and uh, Converting ambisonic to binaural to share spatial music seems a, it's not the perfect way, but it seems like a good enough way to start a musical conversation between composers, not just to like archive it, but just, but send it one-to-one uh, -one sharing or one-to-many sharing and so on. Binaural, I think, uh, would be a very good way to level that kind of uh, playing field. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. And could the next presenter come? Is that Jason Smith? Yes, please. Come and set that, please. And yes. uh, we take the next question. So you, you mentioned Max, and uh, this is obviously a browser with JavaScript code that is doing something. So which part of this is Max? I'm sorry? Like which? a Max MSP that you mentioned that yes. you're using. So I put out the Ambisonic, I'm, I encode into Ambisonic format in Max. So Omniton needs to read a file. You can't really stream through it. So I encode, the, I design and encode the ambisonic environment in Max, and then put out a 16-channel WAV file, and then point that to Omniton, and get things working that way. So you, in this case, you kind of can use just Ableton or whatever other door to in order to produce this kind of file. You just chose to use Max for that. Or is well, something you can, particular you can you compose, I mean, Ableton, composing multi-channel Ableton, I guess oh, you can use Max for live tools and so on. I just use Max, um, and it's, uh, it's much better to like, it's, it's a much better environment to just implement ideas, see what's going on, because you c I, c I also render it to binaural through SPAT, so I sort of hear it as it's supposed to be heard on the web, web browser, but I do it through Max, and then I decide everything, and you can get into more detail using uh, the SPAT library, in my, in my experience. All right, I think we have to continue. Uh, we started a little late, but uh, let's try to be on track. So the next presentation is called Combining Collaborative and Content Filtering in a Recommendation System for a Web-Based uh, DAW by Jason Smith, who we have here, um, Michael Jacob, uh, and Jason Freeman, for, um, all from Georgia Institute of Technology, uh, Brian Magerko as well, and then Tom McLean from the Findings Group. Go ahead, thanks. Good, thank you. Um, hello? Okay. Um, all right, hello. Yes, my name is Jason Smith, presenting this paper. And um, so, as a quick overview, I'm going to be talking about EarSketch, Georgia Tech's program for it's a web based uh, programming tool as well as a combination of an interactive uh, design uh, programming workshop as well as uh, a DAW. Uh, I'll be talking about a recommendation system we designed for users for EarSketch to present uh, sound information to them, as well as how we process the information and generate recommendation scores for samples that a user can use in production for a web-based DAW. Uh, redesigning the EarSketch website to accommodate for these recommendations, and then overview two evaluations we did and experiments on user preferences and user interactions with this recommendation system. So EarSketch itself is uh, an online interaction programming environment. Uh, students either write JavaScript or Python code that we uh, include a curriculum on how to do, on how to write, and they write this code to produce music that then they can hear in real time in the digital audio workstation portion of the website. 
So it's been used in classrooms in the States and contains m multiple full curriculums for lesson plans on how to do general coding practice, as well as uh, musical development, teaching information such as song structure, transitions, etc. cetera. Uh, it contains a large sound library uh, from a variety of Atlanta artists in wide genres designed to enforce creativity and authenticity to improve students' opinions of how their learning is going on how and how they feel as a creative and programming uh, agent. So um, an overarching problem, problem in the past with users for ear sketch is that most of their sound usage has been relegated to a very small amount of the samples. Uh, primarily the smallest portion of the samples that are used in many of the tutorial examples, as well as simple things like uh, small hits or drum samples. Uh, less than 5% of the samples are used in more than a fifth of the scripts, and many samples experience a very small amount. We conducted a study uh, last year uh, interviewing users, and most of them reported in a general sense that they wanted to have an easier way of navigating the sounds instead of lists and searching through a large uh, dictionary of sounds and wanted to be introduced to sounds in a way that was more organic and some system that automatically grouped the sounds beyond generic genre labels and artist labels. So some previous work into listening for sounds. Most recommendation music systems on, in an online context are based in music listening. So systems that analyze user profiles like social media and present full songs for users as opposed to short audio loops. Um, this example, Group Explorer, uh, is one such group that uses for actual compositions where they check information, rhythmic information from dr short drum loops in order to present and group uh, genre labels. This is an image, this image shows that uh, they were using palettes, which is small rhythmic uh, compartments of information in order to map these genres and they show the labels for how they correspond. So the goals of our recommendation system in EarSketch was to address this usage problem to introduce more options for users, to organically add a wider variety of sounds into it, uh, improve an overall sense of diversity and coverage in the sounds used by users in their compositions, so wider cross-genre labels, wider, uh, wider permutations of the sound library in the average user script, and more variety between users themselves and also to enforce your sketch's general intentions of improving students' perceptions of authenticity and creativity in an organic digital audio workstation type environment. So the, um, the, so the recommendation system itself functions by using each sample in ear sketch as an input. For every sample that a user is currently using in ear sketch, it indexes their script and generates a similarity list. That is, it generates a recommendation score that we'll go into that um, uses both acoustic similarity to other ear sketch samples and co usage, or a measure of how often each sample has been used in a previous ear sketch script with other samples to generate a large list comparing the user's input samples to basically every other script in ear sketch to generate a larger recommendation score. Then, in real time, the list of every sample combination which has been uploaded to our EarSketch server for easier distribution, each sample is simply looked up in that table and their recommendation scores are combined for the multiple inputs to generate a final output list of recommendations, uh, allowing for different recommendations uh, sent continuously while a user is interacting with EarSketch and programming something new. So, um, the reason that we avoid using any user information is to conform with EarSketch's privacy policy. We don't want anything that, we don't want to know anything about the user besides what they've already done in EarSketch, so they're combinations of scripts. Users don't even need to make an account for the system to work either. So, the collaborative filtering element of a recommendation system, it uses the sounds in the current script as input, 
and collects no user information, so it's just the previous samples. And we create a large list of samples based on previous uploaded ear sketch scripts to say how many combinations of things have been used before. And we plan <coughs> on improving the system by refeeding it with the recommend with scripts that have been created by users with the improved coverage that comes from generating the recommendations. So the system we run offline, so the computation isn't really an issue. And then we regularly will update this recommendation system, the larger list that gets uploaded to index sounds uh, with the new combination of sounds. Uh, when we developed this program, we used a sample set of 20,000 user scripts, both from tutorials, not with a variety of user experience with EarSketch. And so now we plan on using it with uh, a general selection of user scripts from all levels of users. Um, the content filtering uses short time Fourier transform and MFCC coefficients in order to calculate the spectral density of sounds over time. And we've used this in akin to infant drum machine with this uh, genre labeling and the genre represented by each color in your sketch. And we also use uh, MFCC coefficients to calculate power spectrum sounds. This is for a sort of, this is for a, a longer term and a shorter term grouping of sounds. And we combine these features with, uh, in real time, we, in order to make this program run real time on your sketches servers, as well as the client, which is usually a public school computer in Atlanta, is, um, we limit it to mostly a few recommendations and we only spit out, we only have the system upload frequently with uh, 10 values for this co-usage information to analyze the previous usage of the script and then it updates in real time. So the combined recommendation scores itself that are the final representation of what to recommend based on each individual ear sketch sample is as follows. So for each sample we use the similarity between uh, this between the input sample and what we use our co-usage information to find as the highest commonly used samples. So a sample commonly used to another, we try to find similar samples to what has been used most in the past. Then we also compare these highly co-used samples, what's similar, the final output of the recommendation to generate the score, we use the direct co-usage and the direct feature distance between this new recommendation as well as the original input. And that is summed together in a recommendation score of our three categories. And the direct feature distances can either be maximized or minimized to create different types of recommendations. Meaning if we intentionally provide a recommendation with high co-usage and a high acoustic similarity, we label it as uh, others like you use these sounds. For lowest co-usage and high similarity, we'd say sounds that fit your script for highest co-usage with low similarity, we'd say discover different kinds of sounds. And with lowest co-usage and lowest similarity, we say, are you feeling lucky? And we use, these genre we use these recommendation labels to inform the user of what kind of uh, information's been used to create these scores. We also present this logic to the user when they click on the type of recommendation as an explanation. Um, so this is done for every sample that the user's currently typed into their script, every sample that has been included in their code that they've written parameter that will be in the final song. And then these scores are added together for the final recommendation, and they're scaled by a factor of the square root of n, which is in order to provide somewhere between a balance of multiplying the number of times samples have been used together. So if a user is using two input samples for the recommendation engine, and the same sample shows highly co, co shows having been highly co-used with both of these, then it provides some benefit to that as opposed to just averaging it out, but it's not so skewed in that the system relies completely on the co-usage factor. When we were testing the system, we found that not scaling by this factor would cause most sample recommendations to be entirely in the domain of how many samples have the same basic recommendation co-usage information as possible. And it was feeding into the original problem of users having been mostly primarily relying on the same recommendation combinations in the past. 
To accommodate for the new sound browser, for the new recommendation systems, our sound browser has been updated with uh, these sound folders that instead of a static list of uh, showing these 10 sounds per page and it's a total of uh, 350 pages, now it's uh, a, a sliding window where you just open and close the folders. And this allowed us to create these recommendation folders which are highlighted, representing the kind of recommendation they are. And these sounds within this folder are refreshed and updated while the user types or pastes new information into the script. Um, uh, instead of a constant loop, it only updates when new information is presented, so based on keystrokes, uh, recognizing that the user saved the script, or switching tabs, and um, to save system latency, and it uses whatever script names it finds in the active user script. Uh, if there are none, then it avoids the cold start problem by using previous skips previous scripts either by that user or if they're not logged in, then uh, just analyzing a basic template of random scripts taken from other your sketch views. Um, so we first evaluated this subject, we, we first evaluated this, sub, uh, this recommendation system with a general subject pool of online users from Amazon Mechanical Turk. They had a, a wide range of musical experience based between either regularly working with production software or barely, you know, some never, li rarely listening to music. Uh, and this was a study designed to find general preferences of people completing a task using these recommendation systems. They were given a, a random ordering of these systems and asked to use the recommendations provided for a partial composition. So we would write a sample your sketch scripts and play them the music output from that script and ask them to complete it with one suggestion from each of the four recommendation types. And the users were found to have had a statistical difference, significant difference between B and C, which were the two types with either high co-usage and low similarity or, low simil or lower co-usage and high similarity, uh, preferring those largely above the uh, D, which was, are you feeling lucky, and even more so than A, the high co-usage, high similarity, generally predictable type recommendations. The other study we performed was on EarSketch users itself. We integrated this recommendation system into the actual interface of EarSketch and then tracked user accounts, uh, we tracked user script submissions and saw whether they preview, pasted, and actually used these recommendations. We found uh, significant higher usage from the discovery different kinds of sounds information than all of the others. Uh, users were randomly assigned to a single recommendation type and we could only log under the assumption because we weren't collecting specific accounts if users were previewing the sounds before pasting them. So we said if they previewed the sound and then pasted it, then that was the highest measure of, well, they checked the recommendations and they found the one that they preferred the most. Um, the general observations we can make from this were that the difference in the tasks where your sketch users largely preferred discover different, whereas general, general users preferred discover difference or uh, others like you use these, or sounds that may fit your script, being the least popular is that we labeled and presented them in a way saying that uh, since your sketch users are, have been reported to, uh, in our previous work seeing this, uh, Perceptions of authenticity, we think that the suggested novelty of discover difference may have led them to that. But the important takeaway is that the task being different between general creative use versus fixing a, a partially completed composition means that uh, the users were drawn to different tasks. And we think the general applicability of this is that online audio tools using recommendation systems need to have these very tailored to what the user exactly is going to be doing with the system. So something being freely creative needs to have a wider lens. So uh, these recommendations, presenting them in the sense of it's, well, here is a creative tool to augment what you're already doing, whereas something more specific like completing the task recommendations have more room for being specifically tailored to the experience. And uh, since our system is recommendations being used as a creative element and something already being completed, we can build our system to 
figure out what the user is doing and gather, gathering a user intent for how to complete a project using this recommendation system is important for actually creating the experience. Uh, and in future work, we're going to be specifically comparing each of these recommendation styles against each other in terms of basic recommendation system evaluation types. Uh, actually measuring the representation of user scripts to see if our, the long-term effects of improvement on our system, using user interaction with non-recommendation scripts to compare to see if users are now using the recommendations significantly more or less over time, and uh, using all of these new groups of information to receive the model and improve the recommendation system in the years to come. All right, uh, thank you. Brilliant. So we have time for some questions. Two questions, maybe? Thanks. Impressive. Uh, there is a commercial product just got recently released it's called uh, XLN Audio. It's a Swedish company. Uh, it's called XO. And it, they also have a similar chart, basically, of 2D space and the samples on the space, and they are showing samples in a similar way that you showed on one of the screenshots. So I wonder if there are any, if they are impressed by your research or anything like that, but it really looks super similar to that. And it cost $200, so I wonder, well, how was it related to what you did, or was it just in the air? Um, so our, pri our primary uh, influences in the developing the mapping of the scripts, uh, the different ear sketch sounds, is that well, we were originally looking at things like Infinite Drum Machine, and uh, when we developed this uh, short time Fourier transform mappings, we were using this in, uh, with the intention of grouping ear sketch samples. It's you know 3,500 sounds, which is a large library for including in this public tool, but also it's not a system that's open right now to including a user's sounds. So users are able to include their own sounds into your sketch, but currently we have no plan of interacting that with the recommendation system at all. Uh, uh, not the, so we did start this work before that tool became commercially available. But yeah, thank you. Um, do we have another question? Let me. Uh, hey, um, thank you for the talk. I think that recommendation systems are, in general, quite important, especially in the in this context of uh, music production environment. It can crucially steer the, the user's compositional, uh, you know, musical, you know, uh, thoughts. So I was thinking, it's um, your your system is based on acoustic features of sounds, right? You kind of um, recommend based on their acoustic features, but I was thinking we don't perceive sounds merely by their acoustic features. So, for instance, um, there is a there is a, a really interesting similarity between a bowing a double bass and, uh, and kazoo, for instance, or uh, I don't know, like a, like a squeaking door in terms of their, their overall energy shape. So, as a composer. This kind of similarity, for instance, influenced me highly. So my question is, what do you think how your system influenced the user's musical output? What's, your, what's the influence of this kind of recommendation system on the compositional output? So I think um, going back to the, so this, this all comes back to this uh, original mapping, the spatial information that sounds. Uh, our most important idea when we were developing these recommendations originally is the first of our three recommendation categories. This was similarity to highly co-used. What this means is what we first do is for whatever sample the user decides to have seeding the, the input for the recommendation system, we use the co-usage information to find what has been used most commonly with this. We find in a general sense, so let's say, the user has typed in that they're using some drum loop in AirSketch, and that drum loop is very often used with a specific bass sound. And 
So what we do then is to find similarity high Kelly usage, we then look up the bass sound that is very often used in the drum sound and find what is close to that in the, in the loop. Then, if that loop, that, that, so that's the recommendation output. And then based on all of the things that are close to that bass sound, so one of them may be the kazoo. We present that to the user as something that has been either very often used together before or very rarely used together. So I believe uh, the assumption I'm making is that in this example, the user uses drums that has always been used with the bass and our system recommends a kazoo. It would probably be recommending the kazoo because the kazoo has been very rarely used with this drum loop, but it sounds very much like the bass. So that would be in the category of uh, discover different kinds of sounds. So which was actually the one that the users responded most to. So our recommendation system is providing very novel recommendations in the sense that as long as it sounds close to what people have been using together before, it's sort of bridging the gap between things that are completely rarely combined, but the basis is that it has some similarity that people aren't exploring the combinations without the recommendation system because the people aren't looking through your samples saying, well, I should try out all the kazoo samples while I'm proposing this track. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I think we have to continue now. Okay. Thank you. So uh, the next presentation is called Sounds Aware, a mobile app for raising awareness of environmental sound. That's by Tate Carson from Louisiana State University. Hello. Oh, okay, there we go. Uh, so yes, my name is Tate Carson. I'm from Louisiana State University. Um, you can find all my information on Keybase. So my email, and my GitHub, other stuff. And I'm gonna be talking about SoundsWare, a mobile application for raising aware awareness of environmental sound. So a little bit about how I got started uh, thinking about this app. So it started uh, while I was taking walks around the lakes by my house with my dog. Uh, my dog, this is my dog here. Um, and so when I first started, um, I had a lot of anxiety. I was sort of trying to walk to, to kind of um, lessen some of this. And so I listened to headphones just because it was too much to walk around without any, any sound. Uh, and as I started doing this, I realized there's a lot of sounds of nature around me and I wanted to, I wanted to hear them coming through my headphones, but, but I didn't just want to take out and, and just listen. Um, so when, when, when I tried to do that, I realized there's a lot of nature around, but, but I'm in this neighborhood that's very, that has a lot of cars, a lot of people mowing their lawns. In the States, a lot of people mow their lawns. Uh, <laughs> and there's a lot of construction noise. And so I kind of wanted, oh, and then this is, here's an example of a, some noise. Oh, no sound, okay. Um, So I wanted, I wanted sort of the best of both worlds. I wanted to be able to listen to music sometimes and sometimes just be able to hear the nature that was around me. And so this is what, uh, this is what Sounds Were allows me to do. 
Um, it's a system that if it hears noise, it plays nothing, and if it, uh, if it hears noise, it plays music, and if it hears nothing, it just doesn't hear. If it doesn't hear any noise, it plays nothing. Um, and so Soundsware, it, just to say exactly what it is, it's a web application that runs on a smartphone and uses machine learning to detect human-made sound, anthropony, and masks it with ambient music <laughs> as it ambient music as a user walks around their environment. And uh, so this is a quote by David Dunn that I like to kind of situate a lot of my work in. And um, to what extent might the technologies of communication, art, and entertainment serve as a prosthesis that would provide us with, with experience of wilderness that would not only enrich our human identity, but uh, help us to preserve and expand the domain of the non-human world. So. Um, and then further, so the goal of Sounds Aware is to bring a user's attention to the geophonic and biophonic soundscapes, so the sounds of the earth and the sounds of um, non-human animals, uh, to bring awareness to these sounds that are often masked by noise pollution, that we're, we're often not aware of them in these urban spaces. So Sounds Aware seeks to shift the user's, the user's concept of nature to something that is not separate from us. And so important in this work is this idea of noise pollution. So in 2011, the World Health Organization report, a World Health Organization report found that there is overwhelming evidence that exposure to environmental noise has adverse effects on the health of the population. Um, so it sounds where it shifts the user's attention away from noise pollution and to nature, hopefully, uh, which, will, which may help mitigate the adverse health effects caused by noise pollution. Um, while a reduction in environmental noise is uh, at the source would be the best way to solve this problem, um, masking the noise is, is a possible stopgap solution. Uh, a masking solution is always, is, has already been implemented by several projects mentioned in the paper, but, um, but not yet with a mobile device. So this is what I was attempting to do. Um, and then further, a psychologist Stefan Kaplan, or Stephen Kaplan, uh, found that stress reduction can be aided by the experience of the natural environment by, provo by providing a restorative environment that reduces fatigue caused by directed attention. Uh, Kaplan did not mention sound directly, but a recent study by Eleanor Radcliffe has extended his research to show that certain bird sounds may provide restorative benefits. Um, and so this is sort of situated in the work of R. Murray Schaefer and Soundscape. Um, theory, uh, and so he suggested that we should listen to the, the environment as a musical composition, um, and then he, he categorizes the environments into lo-fi and hi-fi, so urban being lo-fi and rural being hi-fi. So a rural landscape is hi-fi because there's a low noise level, which allows one to hear more clearly. When, uh, when in lo-fi urban landscapes, we are dealing with a lot of sound masking, getting less discernible urban uh, aural information. So sounds where brings attention to that noise by masking it with music. So when you hear the music, you know that there's noise going on. Uh, possibly reducing its negative impacts, uh, just as, as described in the, in the WHO report. Um, the music of sounds where, and Schaefer's uh, environment as musical composition combine as a duet to create a new and unheard work. So also, it's situated in this idea of ubiquitous listening, that um, we can always listen to something wherever we are, uh, and that like people in a city or in a, in, in a sort of or urban environment are, are doing this very commonly. They're creating this, this sort of private listening experience and this was first written about, that I've seen, by Ian Chambers, and he was writing about the Walkman as this first sort of private listening experience that people ha had this ability to create this bubble around themselves. And so this is sort of furthered by CD players and now mostly with mobile phones. And, and then further, there's a sort of news art form uh, that we call an audio walk that's described by Joanna Steindorf <laughs> as experiments and works that combine work, uh, walking and listening to a mediated soundscape over headphones. Uh, 
That an audio walk takes place using headphones is important because it adds a second layer of private sound to any place and situation, therefore transforming or enhancing the current spatial experience. So um, some related work. Uh, there is a piece called The Quiet Walk from Alessandro Atavia and Ato Tanaka. Atao Tanaka. This is a locative artwork, a locative audio walk artwork for explorations of the urban landscape, where the goal is to find the quietest place in urban location. The app notifies users if the surrounding sounds are too are too loud. Uh, it also records the GPS locations of the quiet places that are found so that a user can view a sound map of their walk. Um, this might be the, the project with the closest concept to Sounds Aware, but there are some key differences. Uh, the, the quiet walk only recognizes loudness levels and does not categorize the sounds. Because of that, a loud anthropophonic sound, a uh, human-made sound, is treated the same as the sound that's not human-made, which probably produces false positives. Uh, this more intelligent system was proposed in the conclusion, but was probably not tried because of technological limitations. This was done a few years ago. Or maybe there are other reasons. Okay, so the user interaction of um, Sounds Aware, which I, I will demo this uh, later tomorrow, but I'll just describe it now. Uh, so headphones are required so that the, the microphone on the phone does not pick up the music playback um, and to create the private listening screen. So when a user first opens up the application, they'll see, uh, they'll see it start to guess the surrounding sounds. So is this a car, is this a, is this a bird? Um, and when assured the microphone is working, the user can then start the music by clicking the play button. Uh, the music now responds to the surrounding sounds. The user can adjust the listening sensitivity of the microphone to their, to their, to their liking. So if you're in uh, like New York, you might want it to be less sensitive. Or if you're in a place where there's a few cars, you might want it to be more sensitive. Uh, so after testing the success of the system and interpreting the environment, the user can now add their own training data. So they start off with a certain uh, training set, and they can add their own data for, for things that are in their environment. Um, and to do this, they can select a tag, a sound category, such as a car. Um, they'll wait for a car to drive by, and they'll click record. So, um, and so this, hopefully, will make the system more accurate for people that are in different environments that are not like my own. And so the tags uh, that are available are on the right. Um, and they're grouped into these different categories, which are sort of defining their origins. So geophony, anthropophony, and biophony. So um, sounds of the earth, sounds of humans, and sounds of everything else. Um, and I grouped them like this so that I could uh, so that I can map them in different ways. And so these are the the data points that. I recorded, so everyone starts off with this. So it's the most wind, because it's always windy in Louisiana. Um, footsteps, because I'm always walking around <laughs> when, you, when you're using it. And then birds and, and rain and cars. Um, so more, uh, more data could have been added to this, but I think it, it made it pretty, pretty accurate with the amount that was here. Um, and so what did I use to do this? Uh, m the most important part of this was the, the feature extraction library. So I used uh, Meta.js. Um, and I used the MFCC, the Mel Frequency Spectral Coefficient Audio Feature. Um, and the learning algorithm I used to, to do the machine learning was just simple K nearest neighbor, no tensor flow or anything. Um, and so the, the reason that Meta was important is it allowed the feature processing to be done, the feature extraction to be done on the client. And so when you access the device, you just need a server to get the, the website and the data. And after that, you can walk around. You don't need any other internet connectivity, um, which I thought was pretty important for, for this. So I also used Tone and P5.js for the sound visualization. So the, uh, the composition was influenced by ambient music uh, because I wanted the, the sounds to be sort of sounds that could flow in and out of the natural soundscape. And I thought that would, that would make sense, something not too jarring. 
Um, they were also influenced by Aeolian practices, basically like wind going through, uh, through harps. Um, and the music of Lamont Young, so it uses the Lamont Young's well-tuned piano uh, tuning. So this is the mapping, this is why I, I um, organized the sounds into certain categories so that I could deal with the mapping now. Um, so it maps the lattice of the acoustic environment to the amplitude of the ambient comp composition. So I'm doing some smoothing with the 200 previous loudness values, so they're averaged and the amplitude uh, ramps to a given value. Oh, yeah, so I, I, I averaged a lot the, the previous 200 values and then mapped them to the amplitude. Um, so it sounds where here's an antiphonic sound, the amplitude is faded up to negative 3 dB. If it is a geophonic sound, it sort of rides uh, up and down depending on the amplitude that it, that it hears, um, creating sort of a wind chime effect. Uh, Geophonic sounds also affect the modulation index and harmonicity, um, creating a, a sort of change in timbre. And then if a biophonic sound is recognized, it fades all the way down so that you can listen to the environment. Uh, I did a short evaluation that I'll go through in the next minute. Uh, so well, I'm almost done. So, so I'll just we, you, you can you can read this later. But it was just to see. What, what do people sort of recognize already in their, in their environment, and then after using the app, do they, do they recognize more things? Um, and so for a few conclusions, after I started using this app for myself, I eventually was able to, to, to take off the headphones and just walk around. And then later, a few months later, I lost the headphones, so I just didn't use them at all, and now, um, now, now I can walk around and just listen to the sounds and get less annoyed by, um, by the mowing of the lawns and everything. And I don't know if that would have happened if I hadn't started working on this. It kind of changed my, my conception of, a, of my environment. Um, so future work, I, I'd like to, working with a microphone on mobile and different uh, browsers is, is sort of challenging. So I was thinking that something, some sort of a native app or, or progressive web app would be good. And then there's a library called uh, Capacitor, which would allow you to write one code base and sort of uh, target different, different um, devices and still use web audio, still use like a web view. That's something I might want to look into. Uh, and then something else, user accounts, so like giving the users the ability to save their, their data long term, that's not possible now. Um, and then some people mentioned, a lot of people mentioned wanting to play their own music. So right now it's only my composition, but adding in the ability to, to let people stream from Spotify or whatever. Uh, or if it is, if they do use my own music, they can kind of tune it a little bit to their own liking. So I'm doing a demo of this. If you want to try it, like later, you can, it's, it's up here at Soundsaware. Or you can come to the demo tomorrow um, at this time. So I think, we have a few more questions. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs> we have a question over there. Thanks. Um, you mentioned tracking footsteps as yeah. one of the sounds. I'm curious how you categorize that, whether they were geo, anthro, or biophony. I categorize them as uh, bi biophony because I know they're coming from me, but I'm always moving. You're always moving when you're using the application, so I wanted that to be sort of uh, a silence. And so, because if you didn't, then you would never hear anything. You'd have to stay, stay still. Yes. Thank you, that was very interesting. Um, and I, actually, perhaps the most interesting thing for me was at the end when you said you lost your headphones and then <laughs> your ability to listen to the environment changed. Yeah. And, and um, I personally kind of don't use the word noise and I kind of try to ban it in my students <laughs> because it's usually used in a derogatory sense. Mm -hmm. And I often think of these sounds, that they are fundamentally part of the ecology and somehow we 
need to understand them as ecological in order to change that balance. Yes. So I was kind of wondering, it seemed at the end that you were pointing to a transformation having taken place in your own listening practice, and I was wondering if that's a surprise to you or whether that's really kind of what you set out to do was in a way to not need your app after a short period of time. Yeah, I guess it's sort of funny that uh, I built something that I, that I don't really need anymore. Yeah, I mean, it was to, to sort of create a, a shift of, of, of yeah, how, how you feel about these sounds. Um, I think if I was in a more noisy environment, I would probably use this more, more often, like New York or something. <laughs> Well, brilliant. I think we should continue. Thank you very much Thank you for an interesting presentation. So now we have Anthony Morosco and Jesse Allison from Louisiana State University as well. And their presentation is Connecting Web Audio to Cyber Hacked Instruments in Performance. and this is my colleague Jesse Allison. We are also from Louisiana State University, the Experimental Music and Digital Media Department. Uh, and we're going to talk to you about connecting web audio to cyber hacked instruments and performance. This adventure is kind of something that we both collaborated on over the last nine months or so, merging our two different research fields together uh, for a unique purpose, which we'll talk about in a moment. So overall, we're going to talk about kind of cursory introduction to these two different practices that we merge together. Uh, hardware hacking for music, also known as circuit bending. Uh, and then we're going to talk a bit about network musical performance, which most of you probably here at the Web Audio Conference have experienced or done your own research and composition in as well. Uh, we're then going to talk about the goal of our project and what we succeeded at, uh, I believe we did, <laughs> uh, at uh, expanding the NMP device set. So expanding the uh, amount of devices you can use for network musical performances, uh, and by doing so, by incorporating new devices uh, by cyber hacking them. We're also going to, along the way, talk about the two frameworks we used to, uh, that keeps happening, uh, to get that to work. Uh, Nexus Hub, which is a server-based uh, framework that Jesse uh, created, and Bend.io, which is my side of things on the hardware and cyber hacking elements. Uh, and then we're going to talk about composing with this system, then we're going to talk a little bit, I'll give you a preview of a piece we're going to do tonight at the concert uh, that you'll get to experience and participate in later. So to start off, let's talk a little bit about hardware hacking. So like I mentioned, this is also known as circuit bending. Uh, this is the broad act of subverting a piece of hardware uh, for audio or in this, or sorry, visual, I'll say, or in this case for us, uh, musical uh, exploration. It is an exploratory act. Basically what you're doing is taking a device that has the capability of making sound and opening it up uh, and probing different points along the internal circuitry and connecting it to other points uh, and hopefully nothing explodes <laughs> or catches fire and if it doesn't uh, you'll hopefully get some cool sounds and you're kind of pushing the limitations of this device in a couple different ways both aesthetically uh, and sonically. So uh, some common objects people have circuit bent in the past, you can see it's over my left, uh, things like a speaking spell uh, done here by AJ Gannon. And there's been a ton of academic research on the subject of hardware hacking for music done by people like Nicholas Collins and Reed Gazala uh, as well. Uh, the interesting thing here too is there's a big risk reward balance in this act. Like I mentioned, you are always at the risk of breaking the device that you're trying to hack. Uh, but you're also gonna hopefully get some kind of interesting reward by making the audience see a toy or a media player in a brand new light. And you're also rewarding yourself as a performer by finding a new way to interact with this object, uh, as you can see by like the added strumming paddles and whammy bars uh, to supplant buttons on a speaking spell. 
Uh, I do want to show you some quick examples if you've never seen this stuff in action. So this is a piece by Nick Collins called The Royal Touch. And what he does in this piece is take a circuit board, uh, usually I think it's like an audio amplifier or receiver board, and he's built his own circuit that branches out uh, on cable and uh, fishing weights, little metal contact points that sends voltages out, and he can kind of move this nest of electrical dissemination across the circuit board, and by connecting these disparate points, he's kind of waking up components on the board to create random oscillations and different kind of frequency patterns uh, to create some really sort of chaotic ambient sounds. Get this to play here. Oh, do we have audio? I'm on the decimator. Is that the right one? Very foreboding title for a HD minor phase. Anything? We have audio. We should be all good and selected here. Yeah, it's a decimator, the very scary one. You want me to play it again? Let's hope it works. Yep. Uh, we can go to the next one. I mean, you hear some very uh, cool sounds there. Uh, the next one here. Oh, <laughs> come on. Can we get the audio working? Because the next one's going to be even better. <laughs> it's going to be so good. It's a Fermi organ. Uh, I'll talk a little bit of what I wanted to show with the last example. Oh, if we all, I'll kind of buy some time and we can get the sound working for this. Uh, with the last example, that's a very classic example of circuit bending, right? You're taking an object, you're enacting upon it in a new and creative way. It also shows some of the limitations of circuit bending as an art form. You have to usually be there at the device. It is usually a very tactile device. So if you're not moving those connections uh, through like a nest of wires, you're engaging those bend points through like a button or changing resistance levels through a dial. So it's very one-to-one, -one, uh, very physical, right? Good and some maybe some bad points about that too. Uh, Take example, a less conventional option of circuit bending, the Furby organ by Sam Battle. No. Oh. Decimator. <laughs> what are you doing? Okay, well you hear a very nightmare inducing <laughs> uh, clip. <laughs> of 26 Furbies screaming <laughs> in pitch uh, and broken out to a keyboard interface. So the goal with this example of circuit bending is to move a little bit closer to what we do in network musical performances already. You've got an interface that's mediating the performance. You're not flipping a switch on each of these fur Furby, I guess, uh, individually. Uh, and you're not uh, really kind of worried about the chaotic aspects. You plan this all out and you've kind of moved it into something traditional, like a keyboard interface. But this would be hard to do with one person in, in two hands, right? 26 Furbies and bending these different points together. So bringing it out to some kind of mediated element between you, the performer, and the devices, this kind of set me off on what is now my dissertation research, which is finding a way to take hardware uh, and to move it closer to be... Glorious. Very cool, drum machine not included, right? I told you it was horrifying, <laughs> right? Uh, but so this leads us into the NMP side of things. I'm gonna turn this over to Jesse to tell you a bit more about that realm of research uh, to add on to this. I've got a mic. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, just as you all know, basically the network musical performance has been a focus of the web audio conference since the very beginning. Um, this happens to be the first performance at the first web audio conference, and it was entirely network musical performance. Um, and, and it's been just a wonderful space. So I'm not gonna belabor this, but just kind of walk through a couple things about it. That whole uh, distributed performance types of things where you're connecting many people to each other, devices to devices, all that kind of thing. Um, the fact that it can be very abstract, for instance, people's phones just performing across the space, or something where you can actually touch 
and control, or it can be actually devices and things, and we'll talk about that in a second. The other is that it's mediated, which I think is pretty interesting, um, and something that I like to, to kind of work with. It's that anything that sends into the system can control anything else, or it can control many other things, or you can have any of the other inputs, right? Um, aggregated, changed, mediated, and then controlling one thing or many other things, right? And the, the thing that's interesting about this, and I think that Anne doesn't do justice to, is that every one of those inputs has meaning, right? Whether it's a touch, a swipe, or some control, or perhaps it's some dancer, or some graphic, or some video tracking, or whatever these inputs are into this system can now be mapped, and the meaning from each of those inputs can now be mapped to the meaning of the other things that are being triggered and manipulated, and we'll, we'll see that in a second. But the way that that works um, is kind of aggregating around these, um, the internet of things ideas, right? The internet of musical things, or the orchestra of things, or that sort of stuff, where we're changing, um, we're basically just using it, using it for musical purposes, right, um, in MP. And so I just wanted to bring up this example from um, my work kind of works in this hybrid worlds realm uh, where you're trying to bridge things from virtual worlds into the real world and back and forth. And virtual worlds is very broad. It's not just video games. It's not Second Life. It's whatever. Um, it could be anything, internet, social media, whatever kind of system that might be, but bridging between the real world and the other. Um, this is a, a series of pieces. This first one here is actually a, a piece that has, you can see it down in the bottom corner, is actually a projection of um, Second Life, where uh, in that virtual world, people could come in from anywhere and then play with this structure, and then any time there were interactions with the structure, it actually played music on the organ. Right, so it, we captured information from this virtual world performance, we played it on the organ, piped that back into the virtual world so people could have either virtual or in the same space interactions. And that series of, of events has been played across many things. Uh, we did one where we connected the carillon in a bell tower, which we were controlling, to uh, the Finial Hall, the Bell and Finial Hall for Boston Cyber Arts. Um, we did another one where uh, I had the audience on cell phones all controlling an organ instead of using Second Life, skipped that entirely, um, and did something at the Seamus conference uh, 2014. But the idea that anything can control anything else and that you can have these meanings behind each one of those pieces is pretty interesting. So the way that um, I've been working with this for the last 10 years is through various web app technologies, right? Being able to disperse things, pass things around. Um, the cloud, the server, being able to be a mediator between all the different systems you want to connect, whether it's people with cell phones, projection on the theater, um, audio into you know, multi-channel speakers, whatever that system is, right? Um, but the idea here, and the thing that's kind of interesting, is that once you have all these networked devices, um, you can end up controlling it and mediating stuff. But there's a lot of things that aren't networked. And it's really interesting when you start thinking about the things that aren't networked that you might be able to bring into that network. Right, so that kind of was where I joined in and kind of pushed with this with my dissertation work as well, is taking a device and, and trying to find the goal of adding any device as a networkable uh, device that we can work on to web, the web audio realm or the NMP kind of aspect. So if you're talking about like an organ or a carillon, which is designed to work acoustically and then adds like something like MIDI IO, now if we take a CD player or a toy or a Walkman or a record player or a toaster or whatever you have and, and kind of push that exploratory experimental side that we're already doing in circuit bending and then add in some kind of intermediary circuit so that now it's networked and those actions that were physical like a button or a dial are now aka remote or also mediated. So you're adding some new meaning to that too. And hopefully the goal here is to extend the devices we use in NMP. We use mobile phones and mobile devices like tablets a lot for obvious reasons. They're ubiquitous computing devices. Um, but now we can add new things into that realm too. So what we've done here is 
take Jesse's work with Nexus Hub and kind of bring it over to my work with this framework called Bended IO. And this, yeah, this kind of uh, diagram here just kind of shows you the idea you're taking the top part, which is traditional NMP, and now adding that in with multiple devices. The way we do this is with a hardware solution that I created here uh, called the Bended IO board. Um, this has got an ESP32 microcontroller in the upper left-hand corner there. It uh, adds on some six read relays, which simulate a button press connecting point A to point B. Uh, you've got six channel digital potentiometer to simulate physical resistance or voltage division changes. Uh, a two channel motor driver to enact solenoids to push down tape heads or run a uh, motor like in a record player. It also has onboard ADCs and DACs, which the ones that are on this first version of the board uh, are a little lower resolution than we'd like. So I'm adding a second kind of expandable option for the new version of the board. So you can do some circuit sampling or some voltage sampling and send it back into the device and send it up to control shaders or something digital or visual. Um, and yeah, so we want to talk a little bit to close out here about composing with this system and give you a preview of what you'll experience tonight. So the piece we designed, Gravity Density, has two hardware hacked, or cyber hacked, I should say, CD players. This is based on research people like Nicholas Collins did with CD players in the uh, early 80s, uh, and also uh, users like R229, who worked with CD players to control the playback features, which I'm doing here, as well as breaking the internal muting. So when we pause the CD players now, you're actually hearing rhythmic loops from the same sample being read by the laser as the disc continues to spin. Uh, and I'm also bridging some of the internal anti-skip memory chips, uh, so or pins on those chips, so you can get some data moshing happening with some of the samples that are being recorded into its internal buffer. And we've also added in a uh, distortion pedal, because why not? Uh, and so what we're doing tonight is doing a lot of things with the CD players as source audio, and then feeding that out to you, and then having you sample some things, and we can kind of filter everything we want through the distortion pedal and change the intensity of the distortion uh, through mediated means. So very briefly, it's basically uh, the audience hall has their own um, interface for this, and then because we have a, a number of different sources, we basically kind of structured the piece so that it exposes different things at different times so we don't kind of overwhelm. Um, people can sample things, the process st stuff individually. There's the BenCD players, things being fed into the uh, uh, distortion pedal, and it's just kind of uh, meted out over time. Um, and then I have kind of a controller interface to make sure I, everything's going the way that I hope it's going. So anyway, you will see that and play, perform in that tonight. Make sure your phones are all charged up. Yeah, and I'll add before we wrap <laughs> up here too that if you're interested in working with some of these bended boards coupled with the Nexus Hub software for your own maker spaces and want to experiment with your students or yourselves with circuit bending, just come and talk to us or email us here because we'll be uh, have the ability to send some boards out um, to be used in user studies and things like that. So thank you for your thank time. You. Brilliant. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. We have time for some questions. Are there any in the audience? I haven't been able to connect to the to the Slack channel yet, uh, but uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if anyone is using it. We have a question up there. Uh, thank you. Um, you talked about the, um, the way that meaning um, is involved in the gestures or the interactions. I, I just would like to go into that in a bit more detail, what you mean by meaning. I mean, this could be all sorts of stuff. I think that um, the same way that you can be a music artist or you can be a visual artist, you can also be an interactivity artist, or somebody who makes art out of interactions. Um, and I think that when you think of you know, playing a keyboard, that's one type of dynamic, but also walking to a space, you know, if you're tracking where someone was walking, and if they were walking from one thing to another, each of those places has meaning, and so that path itself has its own meaning, right? And so by using things and actually thinking about what, what the interactions and the motions and the gestures and whatever it is that you're doing, uh, the meanings that are inherent in that, you can actually bring that into your artwork, or you can ignore it. And I think that a lot of times that's just what we do, is just ignore it. But um, 
Yeah, and adding to that on the hardware side of things, uh, an aspect today that I think makes circuit bending still popular is there's nostalgia connection. So even if you're too old to know how a CD player worked or why we clip these to our belts, you kind of get the idea that it's older tech and there's maybe an interest. Or the idea of also upcycling these things and saving them from a landfill and repurposing them for artistic purposes. Now you can couple that with the many different aspects of meaning of how you actually enable these things or enact these things. I, I think there's a room to kind of explore that concept on all fronts here. We have time for one more question. Um. Thanks for the presentation. Sure. Uh, is Bendit IO like an open source, open hardware project? Uh, not yet, no. Uh, it, I hope in the future it will be. Um, but what I'm doing right now is working on, I've got a, a ton of these version one boards that I realized I wanted to add more features onto. Right now I'm building the second version, which I'm hoping, like I said, if anyone's interested in either version to use. Um, to kind of add expandability to it. But the goal is to kind of get it ready so that there's tons of uh, user examples for how to connect this to that. And then in the future, I'd like to try and make it more open source. He has to that. finish his dissertation first. Yeah, I got to, <laughs> <laughs> I have to finish that first and then we can do it. Yeah, But if you're interested in any of that, please come talk to us. Love to tell you about it. Brilliant. Thank you, Anthony and Thank Jesse, you. for the brilliant presentation. Thank you. So the next presentation is by Kitjao Lan from, and Alexander Refsum Jensenius from the University of Oslo. And um, Kitjao, you will be presenting the Quaver series, a live coding environment for music performance using web technologies. Yes. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today I would like to introduce the live coding environment with the developer called uh, Quaver series. So. Basically, Quiver series is a single page web application that runs a domain spe specific language for live coding. So you, you may be wondering uh, why we need another live coding language, because we already uh, have Super Collider, we have Tidal Cycles, we have Sony Pi, we have Jupyter. So why do we need another one? Well, for us, there are two reasons. Uh, first, it's for research purpose, because uh, in our regional center, we are uh, doing researches on human perception on rhythm, and my project uh, focuses on the uh, rhythm perception on life coding. Um, so it will be more convincing uh, that if I have uh, the full control of a uh, life coding language, so when I carry out some experiment, I can have the uh, detailed variable control. And uh, another reason is that we really want to contribute to the uh, democratization of life coding which uh, means that we want to lower the difficulty of learning live coding, especially for um, non-programmers. And as we all know, uh, Sonic Pi has done a great job uh, for that purpose. But we try to do it in, from a different uh, angle. We want to borrow a uh, familiarity of electronic instruments in our syntax design. So what does, it, uh, what, what does that mean? Uh, I will start from a very intuitive example. So this is... Uh, very popular synthesizer, and you can see it has a building sequencer. So what if I ask you to use text to represent this sequencer? In our design, um, we use underscore to represent this sequencer. So underscore means rest, and currently no note will be played in this sequencer. And if you want to play some notes, you just replace the underscore with the MIDI number. But now you, you may be feeling um, that it is really uh, tiring and limiting that if you are required to write so many underscores and uh, MIDI numbers every time. So we uh, make a make a abstraction of it and become something like this. So uh, no longer how long your uh, sequence is, we regard it as one bar. And this one bar of sequence will be equally divided by space characters into uh, different parts. So in this example, it's four parts. And we use the default time signature of 4 So this one bar will, will be divided into four uh, quarter notes. So as you might have noticed, the third part is a compound part that consists of an uh, underscore and a MIDI number. So this part will be further equally divided based on the total number of underscores and MIDI notes. By the way, this is the um, um, a mechanism uh, in Tidal, 
Um, so we, we just follow this idea, but we write it in a different way. And we are not limiting to four or eight. Actually, you can divide the one bar into any number of uh, parts. And in this sample, it's divided into five parts. And each part can be further uh, divided into smaller pieces. So once you have a sequence, the next thing you want to do is to connect it to some synthesizer. So we also use this idea of connecting uh, different functions um, in our syntax design. So we come up with our first uh, syntax prototype. So in this example, we use the keyword loop to take the sequence as the input and output uh, a trigger. And this trigger is the input of the saw two things, and the saw two things will output uh, a signal. And this signal will be the input of a low pass filter, which has the cutoff frequency of 300 and the Q value of 1. And Finally, this signal will be uh, processed by the amplifier that brings the sound signal from the browser to the audio interface. So what if I want to use uh, LFO to control the cutoff frequency of the filter? Because we, we, are, we are not using any parentheses here. Um, but, but instead, we use a concept called reference. So here you can see the, the more there is a reference, that represent the uh, LFO function. This LFO function has a frequency that synchronized uh, uh, to eighth note. So this slash with some characters means a symbol. And this LFO has the minimum value of 100 and the maximum number of uh, uh, 1,000. So this is not assignment. This is just a reference. And you can also um, add reference to any um, function chains for the sake of consistency. And actually, you can use this uh, concept of reference to choose note. So you can see the note A will we, we choose from um, several MIDI numbers. And there are two zeros here. The, the number of zeros will change the probability. Um, and also, for the note B, you can select uh, random notes within a certain range. And actually, you can, as, as I said, like the, the order doesn't matter because uh, the evaluation here is lazy. So you can see you can write the, the reference before or after where you use it. And here you can even write the function in uh, different parts and then later connect it together to, con uh, to create new functions. And also here I use underscores like we, uh, as a kind of placeholder to use the default value. And so, so basically, that is the all the, the in this example uh, includes all the uh, uh, syntax elements we use for this live coding language. So as you can see, it's pretty simple. And based on that, so we have more um, functions. For example, for the trigger generator, we all, we not only have loop, we can also use play. So you can do um, some things in the browser. So for example, you can play a white noise. For, to help you to sleep. Um, you can also uh, modify the speed and you can shift the pitch of the node. And uh, we also support sampler as a, uh, a kind of things. So under the hood, we use uh, Firepad uh, with X editor uh, for the synchronization of our text. And we use uh, OM.js for the parsing and use Tone.js for the sound engine. And this project is completely uh, open sourced, so you can find it on GitHub. So this is how the interface looks like. Uh, as you can see, when you click the run button, it will read through the whole page and, and just run the, the code and play some music. And when you make some um, changes uh, in real time, you can click update, and it will take effect on the beginning of next bar. So um, we, in, in our uh, environment, we also support collaboration, uh, even in different places uh, of the world. Um, so we use this Firebase real-time database to support this kind of collaboration. So for example, uh, you can have some performer, um, you can have some performers and audience uh, answering the same noon. And for example, one performer can send a run uh, signal and it will change the state uh, of an entry in the Firebase uh, database. 
And for each client, including both performers and audience, will have a monitoring function that monitor, um, uh, monitors this entry. So once it detects the change of the run entry, it will just run the code together. So for the parsing, um, I'm going to give you an example of how I define this uh, function. So in OM.js, it requires you to write in its own uh, specific language. So uh, as you can see, I define function as something with a very function name and list of function elements with a separator. So a separator is just a space. And function name, as we, uh, as we just seen, uh, it's, uh, it, for example, it can be loop. And function elements can be a sub, uh, one single sub-parameter. And uh, you can see uh, on the bottom, it can be a median node number or underscore. And you can pick combination of numbers or uh, underscores. So it will, once you have a function, it will generate a parsing tree and gives you all the elements. And a semantic uh, definition uh, is written uh, separately. So it's, uh, the definition, semantic uh, definition is written in JavaScript. So once it detects a function, it will call this JavaScript, this real JavaScript function. And it will, I have some, uh, I've written all the predefined function in a function library object. So it will just call those functions and push it to a global variable array. And then I will use a reduce function to change these functions in JavaScript with, this, with the help of this reducer. This is just a recursive reducer that reads the first function and uh, execute it and take the uh, result as the input of the next uh, function. So I'm going to show this environment in the browser. Actually, we can try something different. Um, if you can enter uh, uh, this address, and the, the address is, sorry. This is the address. By the way, this is how we write comments. And you can enter this new code demo, and you don't need to know the password. And feel free to turn on the, the sound. Yeah, I see. I can hear some sound there. So I can change some parameter and update it. So you get the idea. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So we have some questions. Time for questions. There's one over there. Yeah, this is great. This is a lot of fun. I, I had a question. So what are your next steps? I mean, now that you've got this down, the, the functionality, the core functionality, what are some elements you'd like to, or where would you like to take this in the future, like features you'd like to add? Or? Um, currently, uh, I need to uh, start some uh, research uh, experiments based on this live coding environment. So for example, we will do some user study, and we will also study how people interact with this environment. And also, I'm very uh, uh, willing to um, develop some low-level uh, kind of audio um, engine mm -hmm. to replace this TongueJS. Yeah. Oh, great, thanks. There's a question up there, Norbert. Yeah, very nice. I would like to come back to the question, so why do we need another live coding environment? And could you just summarize that in, in, 
shortly what is really different to you you named three or two or three at the beginning of the talk there are many many others what what is the special thing about yours I think the uh, key idea of this uh, life coding language is that it borrows the idea of how you're using an uh, electronic instrument. So for some musicians, if you have no programming background, uh, but you have played some uh, sequencer before, and you can very easily to get started to learn this life coding. And actually, it is also a functional programming language. So through this process, you can also learn programming. Uh, final question, quick one, over there. Uh, yeah, hello, um, nice uh, nice talk. Um, I think it was it's nice that you're looking from a different angle in terms of syntax design, but it got me wondering a little bit about um, so how is the performer velocity and experience? Because you have to type a lot of numbers, right? You mostly will be using the numeric keypad in your keyboard. And compared to SonicPy, I was just wondering if you look into how it would compare to the... Uh, sorry, I don't quite get the, the question. Can you rephrase it a little bit? Yeah, so compared to Sonic Pi, you, with, your, with Quiver Series, you get to type a lot of numbers when you're performing, right? Uh, what type, type of what? A lot of numbers. Yes, yes. So I was wondering how, how is the velocity when you're performing with your environment compared to Sonic Pi? Because Sonic Pi has a very uh, easy syn a syntax, like it's easy to uh, do live coding with it, I think compared to Cover series, I would say you get to use less the numeric key keypad. Um, well, currently uh, we haven't made made this uh, user study, um, but compared with Sonic Pi, uh, I think um, one main difference is that it runs in a, in a browser and which requires no installation, and and also for uh, performance, I think the collaboration is more. Uh, Important is is also a very important part of it, and and we will have more, more functions and to support um, this um, requirement, and we will do the user study to see what kind of requirement we will need to add. Brilliant! Thank you very much, Ken Chao. <laughs> So the next presentation is by Charlie Roberts from the Worcester Polytechnic Institute and Mariana Pachon Fuentes, uh, also from Worcester. Um, the presentation title is Bringing the Title Cycles Mini Language to the Web. And perhaps Charlie could maybe answer the question why we need another live coding language. <laughs> <laughs> teach audio technologies or anything like that. Um, morning, everybody. Um, yeah, so as, as I don't know if I'm going to answer that question specifically, uh, I'm here to talk about a, a really uh, a targeted uh, research project uh, done by myself and, and Mariana, uh, and it's bringing the tidy cycles mini notation to the, the browser. and. Again, this is a pretty small project, but uh, it, it's been fun to play around with, and I, I think hopefully this is the, the right target audience for people that might be interested in using it and experimenting with it themselves. Uh, so this talk, I'll basically just briefly mention what Title Cycles is, what live coding is, and, and what is uh, the Title Cycles meditation, talk about how we implemented this, and show a few different examples of it uh, in use. Um, so Jesse mentioned earlier that network music performance has been a big focus of the web audio conference. And I think live coding performance has also been a, another kind of focus area that we've seen a lot of in the past years. And so I know 
uh, we, we already just saw a paper now. I know there's a couple more papers coming in the conferences, and there's at least three performances in, in the different concerts that are going to incorporate live coding in, in, in some form or another. So I think a lot of us are, are, are familiar with it, uh, but the basic idea is you get up on stage and you write some code and beautiful music and visuals come out and everybody is happy. Uh, so this is a specific, this picture that we're looking at right here is a specific genre of live coding performance called an algorithm. This was, algorithm was held at the British Library earlier this year. Uh, and in an algorithm, there's all sorts of types of music that is created during live coding performances. But in algorithms, typically the music is more informed by uh, dance music than in some other uh, genres that you might think of. So this year was the fifth anniversary of algorithms. As part of the fifth anniversary, um, there was an organized four-day streaming event where there were 600 and, sorry, 160 performances over four days that were streamed all around the world. Um, and so as one measure of the title cycle's popularity, uh, I looked at all those performances and noted that 65 of the performances um, used title cycles as the main front-end language for music generation. So at least in the algorithm uh, genre of performance, title cycles really has kind of become this, this uh, sort of dominant language. Uh, the next closest was Super Collider with, with 18 performances. And this is again talking about the, the front-end language that people are actually live coding inside of. So what is it that makes uh, title cycles interesting? Uh, so if, you, if you've never used title cycles before, this is a language created by Alex McLean and first presented in 2010. It is built in Haskell, um, and you can code and target it using a, whatever, lots of different coding environments can, can uh, take advantage of title cycles. It outputs OSC and MIDI messages, so it doesn't actually create sound itself or create visuals itself. It's used as an external control language for sequencing patterns over time to target these applications. And one thing I did want to also point out is that it actually is already in the browser via David Ogborn's estuary project. And what David Ogborn did in that is he brought, um, he used the new Haskell compiler to compile the entire system uh, into JavaScript and then placed it online, uh, which is great. Um, the, what I'm going to be presenting and talking about today is a little bit different than we're trying to make just a dedicated, targeted library for JavaScript, no Haskell compilation required uh, to use this system. Okay, so let me just show title cycles in action um, inside, running inside of Jibber to kind of get an idea of, of what, it can cap what it's capable of doing. And one of the big differences, and one of my motivations for incorporating this into Jibber, which is a live coding system that I work on, um, is thinking about timing and output in the, the space of a single notation. So in Jibber, normally you make a synth and then you say things like, oh, I want to sequence that synth, and you define a bunch of different notes that you want to play, and then you define some different rhythms that you want to play. And so you have this separation between the, the output values for the sequence and the, the timing values for the sequence. There are two different separate patterns that you can manipulate in different ways and independently of one another. Whereas title cycles uses, uh, has a unified pattern syntax for defining both the output and the timing at the same time, similar in some ways to uh, what we saw uh, in the last presentation with Quaver series. Uh, and I thought that, that combining those things provides some different opportunities for sequencing that Jibber didn't currently provide, and I wanted to explore that um, a little bit more. So let's, um, I'm gonna just download a sample. And if I trigger it now, this just means play it at the original rate it was recorded at. Yeah. Okay, so there's the, the on break and I can play it back at different speeds and whatever. Um, so to use the title cycling inside of Jibber, Jibber, you just take any method or property of any audio visual object and add dot title to it and then you can create sequences that control that method or that property over time. So title cycle, like, again, like Quaver series um, that was just discussed, it kind of looks at the, the number of tokens inside of the sequence and um, counts them and uses that to determine how much time 
each token in that um, sequence is going to occupy. And so in title, title the, um, the, the length of the sequence is, is called a cycle um, that we're using. So right now I have one entity in, in the pattern, um, and it's going to occupy one cycle. And so if I start that plane, so every time you see the square flash, uh, it's kind of re-triggering that pattern. And as I add more patterns, there are more to this. So now it's moving through uh, all the different um, all the different values that you see inside of there. And so as I add more values, obviously it, it gets faster and faster and uh, increases in tempo. We can also group the different values together. So uh, using this, the, the bracket notations, basically this is now groups to be considered one entity. So each one of these will take a third and then each one of these two uh, will take a sixth. And you can also do things like specify, oh, I want to play a whole bunch of these really fast. So now we have eight triggers playing at the original sampling rate, and then um, one trigger playing at twice the speed. And again, the important thing is that each of these two components occupies the, the same amount of time. So you can, you can think about each entity in the pattern um, individually and, and start a different way to, to, to conceptualize time uh, and creating these different types of patterns together. So to create this um, inside of the browser, where did, okay, we made a, um, we created a parser using the parsing expression grammar formalism. Uh, PEG.js, parsing expression grammars, it's a language formalism that's present in almost every uh, scripting programming language um, you can create you know, using these ideas. And basically, you define your pattern, you submit it to a pattern object that you can, uh, uh, that parses the pattern, and then you can query the resulting pattern objects to get a list of events that you want to use. And that just comes back to you in the form of an array. And so the query, basically, you specify the starting phase uh, for when you want to query, and then you specify how long you want to query um, the length is in terms of cycles. So for this particular pattern, um, we're querying one cycle of the pattern, starting with a phase of zero, and it's giving back these events. Each event has a value associated with it, so one of these three numbers, and it has an arc which defines the starting point for the event and the ending point of the event. Um, these are all measured in uh, rational time values. Um, and then once you have this list of events, it's basically up to you to do some type of sequencing thing that loops through these events, figures out which one of these should play and uh, applies the pattern accordingly. So I wanted to show a, a quick example of applying this to Olivia Jack's amazing Hydra live coding environments. This is a live coding uh, system for creating visuals um, based on the metaphor of, of, of um, analog video synthesizers. And so there's a GitHub GIS. I'm just going to copy all it. Maybe I'll walk through it really quickly to explain it before I copy and paste it in. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to inject the code for the, the, the pattern library that I've created. And then we have this function I've defined that's just called title. Um, and it's going to create a pattern object similar to the slide I just showed where you pass in a pattern. And it, it makes that object. And it's going to generate a, an out function that's going to increment a phase. It's going to check and see if there are any events uh, in a queue. And if there are not, it is going to do a new query to generate a new set of events. And then once the events have been queued up, um, it checks to see if the, the, the next event that's supposed to be played, basically event zero, um, if the current phase is greater than the phase associated with that particular event, then we know we want to trigger that particular event and return the value. So this whole thing here is about you know, 30 lines of code. It doesn't take much to, to once you have the pattern parsing and the querying capability to, to stick this into a system and be able to use it. Uh,
Okay, so I'll run that huge thing. Uh, oh, Charlie, bad demo. Um, okay, so I lost the code that... Uh, okay. <laughs> this is what I wanted. Not that. Not that. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so what this is doing right here is it's making a, an oscillator, and then we have that title function that we just looked at the code for. That title function itself returns another function, and that's the function that's keeping track of the phase and doing the, the querying of the pattern. In Hydra, whenever you have um, a function that's passed to um, one of the, the synthesis objects, it calls that function once per frame to generate a value, and that's what gets used for the visual synthesis. So right here we have this, uh, the, this is basically um, controlling the frequency of the oscillator, so the number of bands that you're seeing right here. Uh, and so in this first part, it's alternating between values of, of 1 and 20 every other cycle and then it's looping back and forth between 50 and 100, and I can jump back in and make that faster or change these different values and re-execute it uh, in different ways. So just a really quick sample of um, trying to show that it's easy to integrate uh, with, with other systems and hopefully into your own JavaScript projects if you're interested in, in taking a look at this. Uh, another interesting project that's already used this library is Diego Dorado's live emoji system. If some of you were at um, ICLC uh, this year, you might have seen this in use. And so the way live emoji works is it takes um, each one of these emojis and it maps a sample to it. And then you can use uh, the title mini notation. Uh, it's all browser based and um, uh, create these. Uh, pretty cool animated sequences of emojis that flash on the screens with associated sounds that, that trigger along with them. The library itself, uh, the GitHub repo, comes with a bunch of different demos, just regular, simple, bare-bones HTML demos. Um, also, integration with P5 is, is, is another demo that's inside of there, and hopefully enough to get people started using it really quickly. I don't think I'm going to have enough time to talk about this, but in addition, I guess I'll just mention inside uh, of Jibber, um, it also integrates with the visual engine in addition to the audio engine. And I did also, I guess I will really briefly uh, point out just the, the little, the, the, the highlighting here just to kind of make things easy to understand uh, what's happening inside of the patterns. Um. Uh, so just giving that little flash to kind of show which one of these is actually being triggered at a time. And the idea is that as the patterns get more and more complicated, it can start to help people, whether audience members or, or programmers who are actually creating patterns, actually understand how the mini notation works and how um, all these different notation features fit together. Uh, so I'll be performing with that later tonight. Uh, and we'll get to see it in action. Um, for now, thanks, and I'll take any questions. Brilliant. Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> so, we have a question over there. Um, um, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, I'm just curious, is the title function in Hydra, like, did you make a pull request, or that was there before? Or? No, I, so I, I mean, I just had to copy and paste the code in and write. So it's, no, it's not in Hydra now. Um, I didn't think about making a pull request to Olivia, but um, it is also <laughs> not, yeah, it's simpler than I made it look like to just copy and paste it in there uh, and, and run it. Um, so. so you can basically like run JavaScript because I've used Hydra, but like, can you just like import JavaScript in Hydra and then use it? Was that so, what happened? Yeah, you can, you can just, I mean, it's, it's JavaScript, so you can do anything you want, basically. I mean, it, so if you, you, the code in that gist basically makes a new script tag, and then it sets the source of that script tag to be the title parser. 
um, and then it, it injects that into the head of the HTML document, and so that's how it gets loaded dynamically. So it's like a hack to Hydra. Yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Well, uh, there's one here. So uh, you, you've programmed Jibber, you've programmed in JavaScript, you're now working with title cycles. Can you just comment on the, the difficulty or not of jumping between language to language to language in trying to do live coding? It kind of gets back to that, why do we need another live coding language? But um, have you found that? How have you found that? <laughs> yeah, I mean. I guess I, I mean, I don't feel like at this point that I'm, I, uh, so I have done performances where I've explicitly been jumping back and forth between languages, JavaScript and GLSL, and that was lame. Uh, I'm never doing that again. Um, yeah, I think, I think there is like a, a cognitive load that's associated with that, and, and trying to get things into one language is important to me. I mean, the, the mini notation uh, with title cycles, and maybe I didn't explain enough about what that actually um, is in compared to the rest of title cycles, but it, it really isn't a language. It's, you know, it's, it's just this little notation to, to, um, that then gets chopped up and, and assigned to different Haskell functions to do things, or in this case, different JavaScript functions to do things. Uh, but the idea of bringing the, the mini intuition in there was like, to try and, I, I, yeah, it is a different way of thinking, but I, I don't know. I don't know, if, I don't know if I would classify it as, maybe, I, maybe there still is a, a, an interesting mind jump that has to happen to go from doing JavaScript into that, that system. I hadn't thought about it, is the honest answer to the question. Well, I could follow up with the final question, maybe. Um, so you've implemented Tidal as a function of Jibber, but it, is it the whole of Tidal language? Or? No, yeah, so that's definitely um, future work is to think about. So this is just the interface for defining the patterns. And of course, a really important part of, of live coding is, is transforming patterns over time. And Tidal has a, a lot of really amazing capabilities in that regards. And so one of the things I'm, I'm struggling with right now is to think about whether or not I want to use Jibber's existing pattern transformation capabilities and apply those to the title functions, or do I really want to bring in all of the title transformation functions inside of there? And, at what point is it title versus what point is it jibber then? And uh, lots of other interesting questions. But I think for now there, there are enough times when I want to use the jibber notation as opposed to the title notation that I'd like to keep maintaining kind of both systems and maybe add an ICSI one uh, to it as well. I think uh, just having lots of different notations to describe patterns uh, can be useful for, for different people in different applications. From the short example you showed, it's, it looked a little bit like you were um, taking the ideas of title but putting it into the kind of type of JavaScript that you use in Jibber. Is that correct? Or? Because yeah. it didn't look like title, it looked like Jibber. It's just the little mini, so just the part, I, again, I didn't explain this part well enough, but just the thing in the quotes. Yeah. Uh, so just this part is the only thing I'm taking. <laughs> And maybe that's not a very good example. I'll make it a little more titly looking. Uh, so just this part in between the quotes is um, what I'm taking from, from mm -hmm. title. And, look, and in title cycles, when you use it as well, it's also um, just provided in quotes. So it's, it's a mini notation that's provided inside of the title cycles mini language um, to, to compose functions more rapidly than having to explicitly type them all out by hand. That's fantastic. It's like a little slang dialect within Jipper then. Yeah, you know, so. yeah. Okay, okay uh, I, that was the last uh, session, uh, last presentation in this session. We have coffee, uh, and then um, we're, Anna, will you tell us when we come back? Yes. Thank you. So yeah, just because we started five minutes late, we will need to sacrifice though a little bit of time. Is it okay if we convene at 11.20? So 10 minutes? 
break. And then please, uh, those who will be presenting in the next session, which is diversity and inclusion, can you please get in touch with uh, Tom Collins and try to set up and try, yeah. Tom Collins is over there. Yeah. So, yeah. And see you very soon. Thanks. Thank you.
Collins and I'm chairing this session on diversity and inclusion. You okay? You want to say something? It's an announcement. Oh, yeah. Oh, at the end? No, you want to do it? Oh. Uh, just uh, for you to know, that will be like a, a final party that is open uh, to any, anyone who wants to join to play. Um, we we want to try to play together, make like a jam session. And there's a feeling for, uh, form for you to feel. So we can arrange the time schedule and everything. I put on the Slack channel. So I'm welcoming you to join. Join us. We don't know who it's going to be, but hope it's nice. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so our first speaker, Carl Schulz, is a master student at the Center for Music Technology, Georgia Tech, working on deep learning applied to audio in the music domain. This morning, we will hear about a project involving the conversion of hands-on exhibit into a web interface, for which Astrid Bin was the first author of the paper. Take it away. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kaushal, and I'll be presenting the paper from museum to the browser, translating a music-driven exhibit from physical space to a web app. So what this paper is about is um, this interactive exhibit called Groove Machine. Um, and I worked on Groove Machine as a software developer um, on the web app um, during the summer. So uh, I'm uh, really happy to be presenting this paper here at the Web Audio Conference on behalf of all my uh, teammates. And um, I would like to thank Astrid for this. OK, so let's get into it. So uh, what is Groove Machine? Groove Machine is a tangible museum ex exhibit that aims to foster interest in computer science through music-driven exploration of a computational system. So this is an exhibit which is um, aimed for children for, from ages around 10 to 14. And the purpose of this system is to look at um, uh, computer science not from, the in, uh, not from the point of view of something that you have to do, but rather it's, uh, something that you would want to do. Um, and to give you a brief introduction, uh, Groove Machine is a tabletop interface where you can place different blocks on the table, and depending on what blocks you've placed there, it makes music. So in this presentation, what I'm going to discuss is uh, what Groove Machine is, how it works, and um, how it achieves this goal of generating interest in computer science. So I'll be discussing the role of interest, the context, uh, the museum and the browser context, uh, the physical design of Groove Machine. Um, then I'll discuss a short uh, observational study which uh, suggests that Groove Machine is indeed able to uh, trigger situational interest. And then um, how we basically transfer, transfer the group machine from the physical thing to the browser. So um, why does interest matter? So in today's world, computer programmers are the inventors, the creators of new technology. And this is a technology that is being used by every one of us. Um, but however, not everyone is part of the technology creating population. And joining this population is not easy. Research has shown that there are, um, there are high failure rates in computer science courses. Uh, there might be other obstacles such as poor teaching, or uh, lack of support from your family, or uh, stereotypes associated with uh, being a computer scientist. Um, but however, intrinsic interest is a factor that can help you to persevere through these obstacles and pursue computer science. So when I, when I say intrinsic interest, you might think that this, is something, uh, this sounds something like it's an inborn trait. However, that is not true. So Hiri and Renninger say that uh, they describe this four-phase model of interest development, and they broadly class classify interest into situational and uh, individual interest. So situational interest is something that, uh, that is triggered by environmental stimuli. Um, it is highly motivating. However, it does not last long. Um, in order to completely develop interest, uh, what you need to do is you need to maintain this triggered situational interest. And through this, uh, you can basically generate uh, individual interest. A groove machine basically tries to achieve this goal. So uh, we need to understand the context of, of where this, uh, this setup, uh, where groove machine is going to be set up in order to uh, uh, understand how it was designed. So museums are places uh, which are ideal for exploratory learning. And these are places where people are free to uh, go and interact with exhibits um, as they want, as, as per their will. And there is no obligation for them to stay at these uh, exhibits. Which is why, um, the, uh, while designing an exhibit, you must keep in mind that an exhibit must be designed in such a way that it continuously engages the learners. Um, and that's why a considerable interest has been developed in active prolonged engagement, or AIP. 
so one of the factors of which is prolonged engagement. And we conduct this observational study to measure this prolonged engagement factor. So considering this your museum context, uh, we designed the uh, physical uh, groove machine table. And so this is the explanation of exactly how groove machine works. So groove machine is a step sequencer with eight radial steps. And uh, the reason why it was a, made a square is to promote collaboration. Because it is a square, it has four obvious places where you can stand. And um, it is, uh, the size is in such a way that kids cannot reach all the way to the other end. So this uh, means that you have to work in teams. And like, you have to work uh, as, as a team. Um, the, the table has arcade controls on four corners, and which are made for, uh, because of uh, familiar, familiarity to kids. Uh, and because of their appeal. And these uh, controls uh, control the global parameters, such as like volume, um, the tempo, the genre, um, and the direction in which the sequencer uh, proceeds. You have uh, these blocks that you place on the table. So as you can see, um, there is a central um, hub, which has connections. And this central, uh, you, you can place all these, all these um, tangibles, as we refer to them on the table and attach them to the hub. Um, there are two main types of tangibles. One is the sample, which is the blue one. And then there are four modifiers. So uh, the sample has one sound associated to it. And the modifiers just um, add some attributes to this sound. Um, so there are four types of effects. One is the reverse effect, um, beat repeat effect, uh, low orchestration, and high orchestration. Uh, the reason for these tangibles being um, you can see that these tangibles are made in such a way that they are they form these uh, tessellating blocks. This is because tessellation has shown uh, has shown to be an effective method of engaging children in mathematical exploration. Um, also, they are symmetric so that you can uh, look as to what the other person is doing and gain intuition from that. So, uh, the question is, how does this help in computing or com uh, computer science, right? So it's all about the metaphors for computing. So the step sequencer is a metaphor for uh, the computational loop. Then you have the samples which act as uh, objects in object-oriented programming. And the modifiers are uh, parameters which you, um, which you provide to, to these objects. So uh, we saw how Groove Machine was made. So we conducted a whole time study to uh, actually see whether Groove Machine is indeed able to generate this interest. Um, so in 2018, in Chicago's Museum of Science and Industry, uh, this study was conducted where the approximate ages and interaction times of groups were noted. Um, in some of the age studies, uh, the average time spent was 3 minutes and 18 uh, seconds. So we recorded 72 groups and saw that the average time spent was 4 minutes and uh, 26 seconds. And we uh, verified these results by conducting a one tailed t test. Um, and these are the results. So the conclusion of this whole time study was that Groove Machine was indeed able to, uh, indeed able to trigger situational interest. But as we saw, situational interest uh, uh, does not last long. So we need to deepen it or maintain it, which is precisely why we developed a browser version. So the browser version um, helps for deep, deeper exploration of Groove Machine and provides a pathway to exploring other CS learning platforms, such as EarSketch or, and TunePad. OK, so now uh, before we discuss how exactly the web browser uh, implementation works, uh, we need to uh, see, uh, find the differences between museum context and the browser context. So there are these three questions, main questions that we need to answer. So when people interact with the system, who are they with? So in the museum, usually uh, you expect people to be in a group and interact as a group. But whereas a user, while using a browser, you would use, usually using as a single user. So why are they here? So museums are places of learning. And when you come there, you have this uh, mentality of, um, uh, of curiosity, basically. But however, browsers are multipurpose, and you can basically use them for anything. Um, how do they experience it? So in museums, you have uh, multimodal ways of experiencing it. <clears throat> Excuse me, experiencing it, uh, where you have like uh, visual, sonic, haptic, and aesthetic uh, uh, responses. And whereas uh, in the browser, it is usually just uh, audiovisual. So to do this, we need to identify what are the core aspects of Groove Machine that we need to preserve. So um, we, developed, we formulated these into two types, like formal, which which is the interaction and UI, and this is the so this is the main um, the main interaction UI components that we want to preserve are the step sequencer and the tessellating blocks, and the functional aspects are exploration and discovery. 
Um, so let's take a look at the browser version and discuss these differences in detail. So, all right. All right, so um, as you can see here, um, the square shape of the table, uh, so I'll discuss the main differences, and um, in the museum, the square shape was quite crucial for the group interaction. However, this doesn't exactly translate to the browser because uh, the interaction here is with a single user, and which is why we can get rid of the square shape and uh, instead replace it with something more visually appealing uh, like this, and which conforms more to the, this, um, this metaphor of, of, of the loop. Um, the next thing that you can note is that, so in the uh, physical version, you had these tangibles which were placed around the table. Uh, and you were free to uh, pick this, these up, put them on the table, and see what kind of sounds they make. However, in this thing, in order to avoid visual clutter, we added them into these drop down drawers. So the idea here is to um, maintain this exploration factor, right? Um, So people can drag them and place them on the table. And when the thing passes over it, it is not making a sound. <laughs> OK. That was weird. All right. Yeah. So I'll demonstrate how these different kinds of effects work. So you have the low orchestration, high orchestration, and the reverse effects. So you can use these uh, different objects and place them and uh, try to, uh, to uh, figure out, like explore and discover new effects. So one thing you would note here that the samples here have these dots on them. And uh, the uh, tangible uh, in the physical implementation didn't have these dots. So the reason for that is uh, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty um, simple reason, actually. So what happens when you drop these uh, tangibles outside is that go back uh, into the drawers. And sometimes if the drawers are not open, you might not know where the tangibles are going. So just to provide a sort of hint, but not make it like a super um, Super obvious. We added these uh, identifiers on the samples, which make it clear that okay, where um, which which the sample this is referring to. Um, the so I will okay. Yeah. So um, then. Uh, the global factors, the, uh, the global uh, variables that you had. The global variables that you had were in the form of this, uh, these arcade controls on the, uh, on the Groove machine, which, on, which uh, control the global variables. So what we did was, uh, is that we moved them to the ground, where we, we can control different aspects, such as the volume. The and the direction of the sequencer You can also control the different sample packs. Get the idea. Um, with this, so there was an important discussion that we had about 
The number of number of uh, modifiers that we uh, number of modifiers that we uh, provide. Um, so you can see that there are eight samples, but there are not eight modifiers. The reason here is that um, if you so if you have eight modifiers, you can basically create this whole complete shape, like uh, like like a flower or something. But our goal here is not to uh, achieve a end state or an end game because this is not a game with like an end. Um, result. Uh, you want to maintain this aspect of exploration and discovery, uh, which is why uh, when you have four modifiers, you are forced to basically try out different combinations and um, see how, how that affects uh, the overall sound. And then um, the main thing is uh, coming back to this uh, uh, coming back to the connection between computer science. So what we can do here is make it, um, in, in the physical implementation, what we had is we had printed out the connection, uh, the, uh, how Groove Machine relates exactly to, the, to computer science. But in the browser, we can make it even more clear by adding the visualizations of how um, exactly the state of all the co uh, code is affected by uh, doing different changes. So. So it shows that the modifier number five has been added to the, uh, that pop. Yeah. Okay, back to the presentation. Right. So for the technical implementation, uh, all the graphics were uh, implemented using PIXC.js, and the sounds were implemented using Tone.js. Um, and uh, the sounds that for low orchestration, high orchestration, and sample are basically pre-recorded sounds, which are downloaded at the beginning of uh, the when the application starts. And the reverse and beat repeat effects are uh, applied in real time. So the conclusion here is that Groove Machine was a system designed to foster interest in computer science. Uh, and the preliminary, indica preliminary indications that situational interest is triggered. However, to maintain this trigger, uh, interest and develop it further, we developed a browser version um, so that people could uh, deepen this interest. Um, yeah. So these are the references for the papers. And uh, we acknowledge the support of uh, NSF. And thank you. You can try out the app here. Uh, at this link. Yeah. Thank you very much. We'll take questions. There's one up there. I don't know if anyone's. You know. No more there. Okay. Hey, hello. Thank you. I want to ask the question if we need another tangible sequencer. Uh, because, of course, we need it, like we need all these uh, live coding languages. It makes the world richer, right? But um, so this looks like something uh, you would use as a, as a complementary thing to the museum visit, right? Like your kids would come to the museum and spend th three minutes, 18, at the installation and then go home and continue playing around with this. Has this been published? Do you have some data on that? Is that, is that the idea? Has, has it been done? Uh, what about that? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I mean, it, 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 will this be connected to the experience in the museum, or it's a, it's a project? Yes, so that's the whole idea. Yes, so, right. Yes. Uh, and do you have some data? Does it work? Do people adopt this? They go to the museum, and oh, then so, they, they uh, go home so and So the browser visit. version yeah, hasn't yeah. been tested yet. Like, if... Um, so the browser version is actually still being developed, and it is like almost uh, ready. But there uh, no whole time study kind of a data has been uh, yet conducted on um, on on the browser version. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, kind of. I guess the idea is that you go to the museum and then you go home and you continue play on the browser. Right. But the, it, it hasn't been published yet, so you don't know if it works. I'm very interested in this after the museum situation, but it doesn't. Right, so it hasn't been, uh, like, okay. a study hasn't been conducted on that. Uh, pity. Yes. Good, good luck, and uh, I hope you come back and give us some data if, if that worked. Great, thank you. There was a question here. Maybe I can get to it quicker. Um, 
Is there any relationship uh, to the project Groove Pizza from NYU Music Experience Design Lab? It's like it's called Groove Pizza, and it has. Oh, uh, I am actually not aware of it. Ah, okay. Well, I thought it was like some kind of spin-off, or okay. There is this project from the Music Experience Design Lab from the NYU, and it's it's the loop idea yeah. is similar. Okay. Yeah, it activates some parts with the. I see. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not uh, aware of it. The question in the Slack is what was the link to Groove Machine? Can you post it there in the uh, Slack? Maybe you do it oh, afterwards. Okay, right. <laughs> we'll put it back up on the screen in a second. <clears throat> It's not localhost 8080, I guess. No, right. So, uh, so the one I was actually um, showed you was like an older version uh, till the point I worked on it. So this is the updated version or like the latest thing that is there right now. So it might visually look a bit different. All right. Thank you very much. I think we have to move on. OK. Um, but let's thank our speaker once more. Okay. What? Hang on, hang on. Oh. <laughs> so our second speaker in this session is Miriam Iowerth. She's a lecturer in music. Um, at the University of the Highlands and Islands. Her PhD work was on improvisation and network musical performance, or NMP. And um, today we're going to get uh, a presentation about NMP applied to ensemble activity for isolated musicians. Thank you very much. Uh, great, so um, I'm going to talk to you um, a little bit about um, yeah, access to ensemble activity using network music performance. Um, probably in a slightly different context, maybe, than what we've talked about before. So I'll talk about what NMP means in terms of my research, um, some of the opportunities and challenges for people working in this way, um, how we particularly use network music performance at the University of the Highlands and Islands. It's in Scotland, if anybody's wondering. Um, and also what the implications for um, web audio, because obviously that's why you're here. Um, so actually, uh, having listened to uh, Jesse and Tony, I've got a slightly, I suppose, different uh, approach in terms of network music performance. So here I'm talking about um, streaming uh, live instruments. So it's kind of broken down to two kind of uh, sections, synchronous, so live performances, um, which can be used for either performance itself or rehearsal, and also that's um, kind of with audio, and sometimes with video as well, depending on the particular uh, setup. Um, but also, importantly, I think um, asynchronous network music performance is also very important in terms of accessing um, ensemble activity, um, particularly for people who aren't quite so uh, techy as maybe the people are in this room. And so that's more um, helpful in terms of um, recording a final product, for example, if that's your interest, rather than um, the kind of uh, collaborative and um, kind of interactive aspect. Um, so my particular interest is in one-to-one uh, -one, um, informal network music performance uh, context. So we're talking about people playing their own instruments um, in their own homes using things like webcams and using the, the kind of audio um, uh, interfaces and things that they already have. Um, and this is what the research I'm going to talk about is based on. Um, so, yeah, believe it or not, there are musicians in this world who do find the technology aspect of... Um, of what we've been talking about. Really, really difficult. In fact, if I kind of talked about this with some of my students, probably either their head, heads would explode or they'd burst into tears. Um, and obviously, that's not ideal. Uh, so, um, I mean, I'm talking to the converted a little bit here in terms of what are the opportunities um, for network music performance. But some of the benefits of working in this way kind of domestically um, are that it's accessible to everybody. If you've got a computer and you've got a, a, a network connection, then you can do this and if you play some music. Um, having said that, there are still places in the world and certainly in some parts of Scotland uh, where rural broadband is a real issue. So that sometimes has a bit of an effect, but um, that's getting better all the time. So as I said, 
There's domestic solutions to this. So um, yeah, you can work just using a laptop. You can even use the webcam and the microphone on your laptop to actually do this. <laughs> Um, and also, as you all know, there's some great creative opportunities in terms of network music performance in um, using the, uh, the acoustic of the network in, in creative ways. Well, I'm not going to go too much into that because, unfortunately, there are some real massive challenges with this. Um, the first one, which everybody thinks of, I think, straight away, is the technical uh, challenge of um, latency. And actually, I don't think that this is quite as much of an issue as possibly people think that it, that it is. And there's ways around, um, around that, and musicians can deal with it fairly easily because um, they're actually used to dealing with latency in, in live performances just through the distances um, uh, involved in music performance. And if anybody's ever played in, in an orchestra, I'm a percussionist, I'm right at the back of the orchestra, um, latency does have a big effect. Um, so there's, there's ways that, um, and approaches that musicians can take to deal with this. The one that kind of seems to happen the most naturally in, in this one-to-one -one situation is musical leadership. So if one musician takes leadership when they're playing and um, they focus on their own kind of internal metronome um, and they play consistently, then the, the, the other person in the collaboration can listen to them and play in time with them. So for person two, they hear the sound coming towards them and they play in time with that. So for the second person in the collaboration, so the follower, they hear just a kind of normal musical situation. For the first one, they hear themselves and then they hear a delayed version of the, the second person. So that's a little, can be a bit off-putting, but it's something that we do quite naturally anyway when we're performing, it's just we're talking about like larger latencies. So that seems to happen without too much thought. Um, when in these kind of situations. And the other way of dealing with this is by the artificial addition of um, latency so that you can um, add latency so that people are playing to a, oh, I don't want to say common beat, but they're playing to a, a pulse that won't be actually the same for the two people in the collaboration. And that have a big impact on the music that they play. So those are ways of getting over latencies. So the next thing is the musician's experience. And actually that's the thing that I was most interested in um, in terms of my um, my research, and undoubtedly it's different. I think it would be very um, disingenuous to say that it's the same as playing in a room together. It's definitely not, it's a different experience. For example, you're using uh, webcams, you're using monitors that you wouldn't have if you're playing in a room together. And also, one thing that's quite important is that you've got a connection that you're switching on and off. If you're playing in a room together, you've got that time when you walk into the room you, you have a chat, you tune up your instruments, and then you start. Whereas with network music performance, it's very much a case of connect, and then you're on, and then disconnect, and you're suddenly off. So you don't have that kind of transition between the, the kind of discussion and the actual playing. And this affects interpersonal relationships, which are, as anybody, anybody who's ever played in an ensemble will know that those relationships between people, between musicians, are actually a really, really important part of playing together. Um, so in, in these kind of situations, they need a bit more effort and they, they need um, the musicians to be very aware of the fact that they need to build up these relationships. Um, and that leadership, that musical leadership that I mentioned, uh, involves communication and negotiation. And again, these are things that can be built up over time. So the next uh, kind of challenge is around communication. So if you think of two musicians playing together, the communication has got two aspects. It's got what you transmit and what you receive. Um, so the transmission might be your body movements, and it's also the music that you play, so kind of gesture comes into this as well. And then what you receive are those two things. You see those body movements and you hear the music. And both aspects of that can be affected by network music performance because um, you've got the limited view on the screen, you say for example using a webcam, if you're using video at all, and also you've got all the, the kind of artifacts that come along with streaming music, um, which also impact on what the musicians hear. But what's really interesting about um, this is it's going to have an impact on coherent performances. But the great thing about network music performance, and so when I'm talking about coherent performances, I'm talking about uh, timing, tuning, and dynamics in particular. But what's great about this one-to-one -one situation is the question of who actually judges what is a coherent performance. Because if you're playing with an audience in a network situation, then the audience will judge that. But if there's just two people, then actually, does it really matter, I suppose is my question, of whether you're dead in time with each other or whether your, um, your dynamics match each other? In some situations it will, but in other situations it probably doesn't matter too much because um, you're the only two people in the, that collaboration. And again, it's different to playing in a room together. 
Um, but I think these things are probably less important than what we might think. And another aspect of communication is the use of video. So a lot of these systems will use video. But what I found is that actually video, it is used while musicians are playing together, but it's much more used when musicians are discussing their work. So before they start, and once they've played something, they'll discuss it and evaluate it. Um, and that is when the video is most useful for the musicians because of the latency aspect. Um, the video is used less for the kind of critical timing aspects of uh, playing music together as it would be in a room together. So when you're performing, you tend to look at each other for cues and things. But obviously that doesn't work quite so well in uh, networked music performance. So another aspect um, that is affected is the kind of music that, that is played. Um, in this situation. So remember, we're talking about musicians who are playing their own instruments who are picking the music that they want to play. So, as we probably all know, there's certain things that work better in these kind of situations than others. Um, one is the rhythmic content. That's really important. So kind of steady music with a set pulse works really well in this because, obviously, going back to the latency, that's, um, you can deal with it a lot easier than music that's changing through time. Um, and also kind of really free music where the pulse is kind of less important. So those work really well. And things in between, so for example, classical chamber music is quite tricky in this situation because you've got lots of changes of time, uh, for example. And another thing that I found um, is that creativity and risk-taking are definitely affected by using this uh, kind of technology. So musicians will tend to play safe as they as they say, so um, they're less likely to take creative risks because they're afraid that they won't be able to kind of follow through with them if their timing isn't quite right or if they can't quite communicate with each other. Uh, so, I suppose, why do I care about all of this stuff? Well, I care about it because obviously ensemble music is great for individuals and also for society, um, but also I uh, work with musicians across the Highlands and Islands, and this is one of the ways that we can connect together and we can play together. So um, that, that map is deliberately quite small, actually, with all the blobs on it. Um, so that's a map of Scotland, and all the blobs on that, um, on that map are kind of hubs as part of the University of the Highlands and Islands. So, the students who go to these different hubs, or a lot of them work at home as well, and they can access their education. And the university does all sorts of subjects, but one of the ones is uh, the applied music degree. So network music performance is a really important part of this because it allows the musicians to play together when they're not physically in the same place. So has anyone actually been to the Highlands and Islands? I know a few people mentioned they have. So uh, the conversations I've already had about that is that transport's quite an issue. It takes a long time to get from one place to another. Although physically, it's probably not that large. It's the, the kind of infrastructure makes and the geography makes it quite difficult to get from place to place. So for example, we have students who are up in, Scar uh, sorry, up in Shetland, which is in the very far um, north there. And that's a 12-hour ferry ride to get there from Aberdeen. Um, and then obviously we'll transport from there. So having a way to be able to perform together when not physically in the same place is very important. Um, so we do, we do um, recognize that, that being together is very important. So we have uh, residentials throughout the year where all the students get together. But in between, we teach using video conferencing. And some of the students also have um, Skype instrumental lessons. If, say, for example, our students in Shetland want to access music uh, tuition down in um, Glasgow or Edinburgh, then they'll use um, Skype. And we also have collaboration partners for different residentials. Um, so, What's quite interesting about this is that this gives us a great opportunity to use some of this technology, but as I mentioned before, most of my students, if I talk to them about kind of music performance, their heads explode or they burst into tears. And, and the technical difficulties of doing this is actually the biggest barrier. So we do a lot of asynchronous collaboration. That's fairly straightforward. The musicians can record themselves, they can share their work. But when it comes to actually live network music performance, this is really, really difficult. Um, and it's not that the software doesn't exist to do it. It definitely does. But to, for those students to be able to access that is really, really difficult. And I don't have any answers for this, and I would really hope that some of you do. Um, and one of the major things is, um, so they might, we've used uh, Soundjack, I don't know if anybody's used that, but um, we've attempted to use that, but the biggest barrier to that is all the router settings and getting the students to set up port forwarding and all of that kind of stuff. So um, I kind of sense that this, uh, the idea of live network music performance is very much for technology enthusiasts and probably not quite so much for musicians who, who just want to play together. 
Um, so um, my question, next question then is why should you care about this? Um, well, I think it's important to understand how musicians, so musicians who just want to play their instruments, how they um, kind of perceive this and also the kind of things that happen to them when they're actually playing like this. So the first thing is that, as I've mentioned, latency might not actually be the biggest issue when it comes to network music performance. So I think there's a, I don't really want to use the obsession, but it's almost like uh, latency is the biggest thing and this is what we have to deal with. But actually, I don't agree with that. And I think that musicians can deal with a lot more latency than you might think they can. So I would say maybe if we can put that to one side and look at some of the other issues, that'd be really, really great. Um, so another aspect of this is how, the, um, how you want musicians to use the software. Um, so for example, if you, want, um, if you want the timing to be as perfect as possible, then you'd probably use, the, you'd probably use a um, si uh, system that delays signals more and you can kind of match the timing up. But actually, that will very much affect the music that gets played. So um, a lot of my um, students are traditional musicians, and they just want to play tunes. They just want to play things that they're used to playing. So if you add latency to that, then it becomes impossible to do that. So um, yeah, m making a system that has additional latency will affect musical content. So maybe if you can think about something that doesn't try to do that artificially, then that will change the musical content that gets played. And another thing, I very briefly mentioned it, which was um, the use of video in the uh, network music performance system. So obviously, if you're using video, then you're going to increase the bandwidth requirements. Um, but I would argue that you can actually have a video um, aspect of this. It's very important. I think it's very important to have some video in it because it allows for that interaction, the interpersonal relationships. But I think from a musical point of view, you don't actually necessarily need it. So my suggestion would be to have a mu uh, video that you can switch on and off um, either be difficult to do that automatically but so that the musicians when they're actually playing they can just uh, switch the the video off um, which will allow the um, the audio to take priority and I suppose the final issue is if you do decide to have video do you want to synchronize that to the audio feed because that's going to have um, uh, additional impact on your latency of your audio so those are my um, I guess, questions for you to think about. And if anybody's got any thoughts on this, I'd be really interested in, in talking to you. Um, so just to conclude, I suppose, um, I think that meaningful musical connections can be made using um, typical domestic equipment and broadband connections. And I would really like to see a very, very simple one-to-one -one system um, that doesn't assume any technical proficiency on the, on the terms of the users. And that is all I have to say, apart from thank you very much for, uh, to the, um, the diversity funding uh, for this conference who helps me get here. So thank you very much. OK, thank you very much. There's time for questions. So if anyone has one, let me know. Yes. Thank you for the talk. That was really great. Um, I'm kind of curious at what level of musicianship this ability to compensate for latency comes in. Because I know like for a beginning musician, it is very difficult to play out of time with someone. And it would be very difficult to imagine people not falling into what they perceive to be lockstep, but actually being out of time. And I'm curious yeah. if you know like, or how you would imagine developing that skill over time? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. But it tends to be, I haven't got a definitive answer to that because I think it would be quite difficult to measure that, but it tends to be that this works quite well for sort of kind of slightly experienced musicians, not beginners, but also not professionals as well because it gets to a point where if, say, I've worked with quite a lot of classical chamber musicians who are kind of like, no, I can't work like this because this is not what I do. And it's so difficult. Oh, I can't do it. But it tends to be the people who haven't quite got to that level of kind of ensemble playing that are much more open to accepting this. Um, and it's very much about attitude of like, can I do it? Yeah, I think I can. And then you probably can. Whereas if you get to a certain point beyond that, we know no, I can't do it. And also, as you say, for beginners, it's just like totally impossible. So yeah, it seems to be sort of somewhere in, in the middle of kind of before you've got to that really, really highly um, uh, honed ensemble playing, 
but once you're beyond uh, kind of like struggling with actually playing your instrument, for example. That was my percussion thing, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, another question there. Hand up again. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, <clears throat> you, I think uh, since the delay overall can be an obstacle, but it can also be a creative tool that a lot of musicians use, maybe the solution to the delay in uh, online performances is that you actually hear both. You hear yourself in, in uh, right now and the delay as well. And then you, if you can use it as a creative tool and others can uh, tune to the one that you hear after time, maybe that is the solution to that. Maybe that will be the different kind of music to play, but it will still be the music that you can play all together. Yeah, I think that's a really good suggestion. And I think it also comes down to sort of like, if we're thinking about a system that someone's using, maybe educating the people who are using it is that, yes, you will hear this. It's not a fault with the system. It's something that, because bear in mind we're talking about people who are not particularly technical in a lot of cases, that this is a feature and this is exciting and you should be really happy about this and, and using it rather than, ah, uh, this is wrong. This is not, not right. I can hear myself. So, yeah, totally. Uh, any more questions? I've got one, but I will let anyone else take take the place. All right, my, my question, I might have missed it, but getting distracted by other things I was doing, is what technology are you using predominantly right now to achieve this one-to-one -one thing, and does anyone in the audience have suggestions for alternatives? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, SoundJack is the one that okay, I have so tempted you. Yeah. With that. Okay. Um, but all the, actually, because it's so difficult, the research that I did, I actually had to um, kind of simulate it by using protocols and people in different rooms and adding latency and stuff. So actually, I, can, I haven't found anything that's really kind of easy to use and, and accessible, so. Okay. Yeah, if anyone wants to come and talk to me after, please do. <laughs> yeah, I'll put links in the Slack for things to, to try out. Okay, let's thank Miriam um, once more, and Jesse, if you want to come up and set up. Thank you. All right, uh, hello everybody. Um, this is a, a, a little bit different than my normal um, uh, activities. Uh, I came to this as an artist, um, but I was invited, invited, I was asked to, um, if there might be something that would be a, a reasonable thing to put on for an opening of the Baton Rouge Entrepreneurship Week. This was in 2017, so it's two years ago. The reason I'm presenting it now is because um, we did a couple things that were sort of innovative in it uh, that I hadn't seen done since. So I thought, let's bring it here and see what happens. So, we think. Um, so what is Brew? Um, it's basically an economic development tool. Entrepreneurship week, people come, they uh, talk about entrepreneurship, get training, they try to get funding, they meet other companies and, and uh, angel investors and that kind of thing. Um, this, I think, will basically sum things up, right? It's the big check. So um, essentially, this was actually this, this last year, um, this is a, the sort of event that's very corporate but, and really needs visibility, right? So 
it's ultimately about getting people in there so they can make connections and then encourage entrepreneurial activities around Louisiana. So um, as part of this, every year there's an opening event uh, which is basically mingling, uh, connecting, and drinking. And it's the sort of thing that is just supposed to loosen people up for the rest of the conference and get them um, kind of excited about it. So with that, there are some sort of corporate goals that, that went along with this project, right? Um, one, to engage people. Two, to excite people. And three, to connect people. And this is exactly um, the business-oriented kind of aspect that went. So basically about three weeks before the event, um, I and Derek Ostrenko, who's a digital artist there at LSU, uh, were asked if there might be something to, to, that would be interesting, that would fill these gaps that could be um, at this opening event. So with it, we had a few constraints. Uh, one, that it should just be an entrance, then it'd be the transition into the, the opening event that would be engaging but brief, because they want people to be connecting and not playing with our stuff. Right? Um, that it would recede into the background, and since there's going to be music playing at the event, that whatever we did sound-wise, which is my field, uh, would need to either work with it or stay out of the way. Um, and then uh, that there should be some sort of wow factor, and uh, that's, that's a quote. So we needed a wow factor. Um, and then also, uh, as I mentioned, oops, there we go. Um, we had two weeks, right? Uh, three weeks from when they asked, two weeks from when they approved it, and so it was going to happen really quickly. Um, so the main thing was that I was thinking about at this point was how to make this work worthwhile, right? I didn't have to do it, but if I did do it, I'd want to make it something that was interesting to me. Um, at the time, I was working in a number of different things. One was this hybrid world stuff, like getting virtual world stuff mapped onto real world things and trying to create these sort of interactive experiences that are kind of shocking because of that. Um, working with this, the idea of personal versus, or personal and private things, like personal cell phones, right? It's your, your mind downloaded onto this thing and your connection out to these other social networks and stuff. And then the idea that, it, or balancing that against the social or the corporate um, as a whole. So I think that those are very interesting things and I think that when you reach from one to the other, um, then it's kind of a shocking sort of thing. So, and then the last one was the distributed performance system. So trying to get things out into um, cell phones, into uh, projection, into whatever, just ways of, of getting this information back and forth. Some of the things that kind of led up to it, uh, the traversal, I, I mentioned this earlier, was one where we were connecting things that were either MIDI controllable or not, uh, to cell phones, to Second Life, that sort of stuff, and then doing performances of it. Um, Blue Mars was another VR thing. Uh, and another one was this Flickr getter, which is kind of a, an experience that was in a, um, a cave environment. We did it, did it all in a virtual world in Second Life and Blue Mars, two different ones. Um, but then we also did it in two cave environments. This one was in Mumbai. Um, where people could come up to it and there was a touch screen, you could play with that, or you could just pull up your own cell phone and start pulling, doing searches through Flickr, through tags, and then they would all res and create music and sound, and there was this big visualization thing. It was kind of fun. But it was kind of interesting because it was able to be done on your device, right? Um, which was quite cool. Oop. And then one last one, uh, of my own, uh, a work that I did with John Philwalk and Mike Pounds, where um, this was sort of an interesting one. Uh, I worked with Michael Pounds on an audio installation called Displaced Resonance, which was these sounds that he had recorded uh, on a trip to Japan that were played through uh, PVC pipes, um, and they were kind of interesting sounds, and they res resonated at different lengths, right? And we hooked up uh, infrared uh, trackers or infrared proximity sensors to detect when somebody was in front of it and then activate the sounds. Well. Um, about a year later, we worked with Don Philwalk, who's a visual artist, and we made a virtual version of it um, entirely in Second Life, um, where it could do things like things would float, lights would change, and all that sort of stuff. So about a year later after that, um, we made this version, which is back in the real world, 
and we did video tracking with infrared lights, and so each of these boxes has uh, color things, so when you walked up to it, it would actually change the lighting of it, detect you were there, just play these sounds back, and you could interact with it just like it had been in the virtual space, and it actually connected with the one that was in Second Life, too. So you had these kind of ghosting effects of people walking through it virtually versus real. And then one last thing that inspired me at the time um, was I'd come across this piece by uh, Ryuichi Kurokawa, um, which used lasers. And what was really interesting about this was that the lasers uh, he shot onto the projection screen and had the video and the lasers timed and aligned perfectly so that any time it hit it, uh, visual events would happen, as long with uh, wave field synthesis sound effects and that sort of thing. And so it had this great uh, translation of things between this very physical space and these visceral sounds and, and visuals um, into, yeah, it was just, it was quite remarkable. So with that, um, we developed a couple of artistic goals, and one was to take a personal experience and on a private device, so people's cell phones, make it public, make it connected, and make it identifiable. And yes, this is very po problematic, um, but it's also interesting because it's problematic, so we can talk about that later. Um, so what we were looking to do was basically, as people came into this event, have them pull out their cell phones, do something, and have it affect everything, right? Um, so the technical things was I needed to be able to ID an individual to play sounds on their device, because I was interested in the lasers. I thought we'd do a laser projector and actually be able to shoot them with a the laser whenever something happened on their device. And then um, track them individually, yeah, shoot them with a laser. So then I had personal goals, and that was to get a laser projector. So that was my goal. Um, but this actually caused a problem, because we only had two weeks. We proposed it and then started looking into what it was going to do and how to get it done. And our problem ended up being that uh, in the U.S., <laughs> the FDA has to approve any usage of lasers, um, and it takes months to get approval. I had two weeks. It wasn't going to happen um, at any rate. So we had to swap it out and just do projection onto people as opposed to shooting them with lasers. Oh, well. um, so our original site was this. So this is the space. It was going to be the entrance. This thing, this round wall was where we were going to project. Uh, a, a large display, they would come in, they would get entrance, you know, they'd get their, their packet stuff, they'd pull open their phones, do their thing, we would track them from here and project on them, and then they would go into the, the space. So, like with every business thing, um, the event changed, and so we got moved. And so then, uh, basically, the week that we set up, we had to change things around. We still projected on this round wall, but this was the entrance to the space. There's the space itself where people would walk through, and then the event was, ended up being held upstairs. So in this area down here um, was where we would be doing the tracking and projection. So this is the final site. You see the round wall, and then that space where they would walk through, we'd track them, and then they would come up top. And here was our design. We only had two weeks, so there we go. Um, our final design uh, ended up having like electronic music, uh, but very uh, just ambient, uh, played across any device that was in the space that was on the page. Um, then there were spoken phrases. They were all inspirational quotes. You'll see some a little later. Um, and they were all across... Uh, across all the different devices, there's a giant projection on the innovation wall. Um, projection, that's the logo kind of moving around on there. That's an Albert Einstein quote, apparently. Um, we had about 117 quotes or something like that that were just inspirational things for, for entrepreneurs, which we thought might be kind of useful. People dug that. Um, so we basically projected something. We uh, put the... Uh, uh, stuff, sorry, web page out on people's devices, which made sound, they could interact with it, they could move it, um, and it would, this little visualization changed. Uh, we would push uh, phrases out to their device, and every once in a while, the entire thing would flash, and uh, individual devices would flash a, a certain color, and then uh, we had a camera above that would color track it, uh, color track the device, and then 
idea them in space, and then we could project on them as well, right? So you could have this phrases uh, spread out across a number of different devices. Um, that's basically the entryway, kind of a little forest of, of iPads. We think we had 10 arranged around different places. So this is uh, during setup. This is one of the ways or ways that it would work. Um, when we'd send a specific color to a specific device, we could then track that color idea and project on them. Cool. Um, so the effectiveness was, was kind of interesting. Basically, everybody's had a website that played sounds, which played an, or, uh, played an audio file that displayed an inspirational quote. It's no big deal. Um, but we tried to make it a little bit different so that it would respond when you moved it. Uh, it would synchronize with a projection, so what was on your device could actually be displayed for everyone, which is kind of an interesting effect. It spoke words on your device, as well as spoke words across your device to the next device to the next device in the space, um, which made it kind of this weird. Your personal device is now part of this big, bigger experience, um, which is where the web audio side of things came in. Um, yeah. Kind of moving to technical details. Um, basically, we had a web server that provided all the web access or web views to any user, to the wall projection, to the floor projection, um, to this little forest of iPads, uh, to the controller or for testing, so you could actually control this thing and, and test out different things, um, to an, a computer that was doing all audio synthesis for the entire space, not just the devices. Um, and then a video tracking computer so that it could then send the video tracking location up to the projection and then that would go to the floor projector and then get uh, projected. So with lots of setup, lots of charging. Um, this is the setup from above, basically a large uh, short throw projector spread across the, the floor there. I think it's 6,000 lumens or so. Uh, the camera was attached to it, so it was from the same vantage point. Uh, a couple different computers. I think there's one more underneath the table. Uh, each one kind of rendering a different aspect. Sorry. Um, we did video tracking. I did it in Jitter with the CV objects and tap tools. Uh, and a GoPro camera then just fed into uh, Blackmagic capture card. So some of the views. Um, if you see up to the, the right or left, the right, there you go, um, are a couple different client images that would show up on people's phones and stuff. Uh, the one on the top is the actual display that was on the wall. And then this is the one that actually is generated for the floor. You can kind of see two different things here, that and that. So as one kind of radiates out. Um, I'll show a very brief, uh, we're gonna skip that one. Let's do this one. Um, a very brief clip here. Not quite sure how loud this is gonna be, but we'll see. All right, so this is one device, one client, and then the floor, and you can see kind of the uh, event happen, and that color changed. It got detected on the floor and then projected out. Um, I think it happens here again. There's the green projected, that sort of thing. So this sound that's happening is actually just uh, one device, and we had... 10 iPads, a bunch of speakers around the space, and then anybody's in the space. And so it created this kind of shimmering um, effect kind of across the whole, the whole thing. Um, yeah. So we had a couple problems to solve. Uh, one of them, the big ones, was whether or not somebody was there. And uh, with websites, it's hard to track when somebody leaves. So we basically pinged everybody, or had their web page pinged back to say, I'm still here. And if they were still here, we could use them in the projection. Um, we also had the iPad devices all out there so that um, even if nobody was on, you could still have the event uh, occur. Um, we had to split processing across lots of places. And, um, and, then, and then we did the four screen coloring to color tracking to ID people, and then we could actually display stuff on them individually. Um, we did end up getting the laser projector. We just couldn't use it at the event. So we tried it out with it. It was quite fun. And then swapped the projector in. Um, oh well. So anyway, back to the conclusions. Um, basically, it would have been great if we had more time. I suppose that's always that way. Uh, but it turned out pretty well as, as the way that it worked. Um, 
it would have been better for us than our original plan was to integrate it into the conference website. So whenever you went to it to look at the program, that sort of thing, it was all kind of in the background, always going. And that also meant that if you were in the space, we could track you and target and do the event. Um, but it just, it was too fast or the event happened too quickly to be able to get it up there. Um, yeah, fog and lasers, that would have been great. And then the, the last thing was combining the video tracking with the web interaction. Um, was very, actually quite effective. Um, and so we're I'm not really looking at doing this as another business event. I mean, maybe somebody really wanted it, pay for it, whatever. But um, artistically, I think there's some really interesting things you could do there that kind of border on that boundary between uh, private uh, personal devices and, and this uh, corporate space. All right, thank you. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. We have questions. I will. Uh, I'll start with one. Then I was um, looking at your your slide about you know the um, some of the lessons you learned from trying it out, what worked or you know what, what perhaps didn't. What was your sense of um, like were you there? Did you see people <laughs> working with it? And what was what did you infer from their experiences of yeah, it? Yeah, it actually worked pretty well. I mean, yeah. basically, people came in. Uh, almost everybody looked at the the event thing and then looked at the iPads and stuff. About a quarter of them, maybe a little less than half, eh, about a third. Anyway, actually pulled out their phones to try things out. Everybody who tried it out ended up bringing people over to show them. Right? That was kind of a weird but kind of fun thing. Um, I do have to apologize. I do not have great <laughs> documentation of this. Um, I have pictures, and then that's, and then a couple of like very, you know, grainy uh, cell phone pics. But if you want to see some of those, you can just ask me afterward. But um, yeah, yeah, it was, it went well. I think lasers would have been much better. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Other questions. I will ask one more then, and then I'm going to check the Slack just in case. Um, could you say what you have in mind for lasers <laughs> oh, <laughs> in, yeah. in the future? Yeah, actually, yeah. Um, you can put a, a, a diffusion lens on the laser so that it that won't hurt people's eyes, um, and then get permission to uh, uh, shoot it into crowds and that sort of thing. So um, in this case, basically actually shooting the device and then having the device make these crackling sounds and explosions and that sort of stuff, right? So, but the, the ability to, to bring your device into the space and really connect it is quite visceral. So I think that's, that's the, the thing. As it was, it was kind of like a projection kind of out around you okay. as the person who had the sounds that were, were going on. Uh, any, yes, there's one there, okay. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I just want to ask, uh, you were tracking the people from above with the camera yep. and uh, according to the color they had on the screen, no? Yep. yep. But like, if you have the camera on top of the people, like they are in the middle, they can also get in the middle. Like, could you actually access the screen at all times or how do you get around that? So in the, in the original spot we had, we actually had the camera out in this very high balcony and it was quite nice because no matter where they were, we were vertical enough right. to catch it. In this space, it was only one balcony up and then kind of up on a pole. Um, so it was, there was a way to include it if you were looking. It was kind of convenient, actually. You'd have to be looking outside to block it. But if you were on the side or towards us, we right. caught everything on that side. So okay. it worked out OK, but higher would have been better. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Jesse, one more, one more time. Thank you.
and a warm welcome to you and thank you for still being here. I'd like to begin um, as an introduction. This project is an artistic doctorate which I'm studying at the Zurich University of Arts in cooperation with the doctoral school in Graz. Um, the experiences from, from earlier research projects are included as well as considerations on how a distributed audio stream can be combined with visuals in space and mobile devices. Uh, but first I want to talk about the theoretical framework of this project. Um, there's an, an ongoing discussion about liveness and the use of media uh, in uh, lecture acoustic music and um, um, uh, audiovisual projects, for example, by John Croft or Philip Auslander or Erika Fischlichter and others. Uh, the question is, whatever I receive, how does it address the audience, how does it address me and the others? In loudspeaker concerts, the sound generation is separated from the sound reproduction and there is often no way to understand how this sounds are produced. Sometimes there is, a missing, there is missing a feeling of liveness. In contrast to instrumental music with performers playing live, there is no certainty of witnessing an unique moment that lends something special to the present and the concert and the performance. So this project follows the idea that space can make a significant contribution to giving the audience the feeling of liveness. In contrast to a strategy that places the physical presence of the performer in the foreground or to emphasize technical interaction, the spatial arrangement of image and sound projections, projections is also suitable to create liveness and presence and to bring the peculiarity of the moment closer to the audience. In this context, it is also important how the artistic work can address the listener personally and at the same time achieve the perception of a unity with distributed images and sound sources. As far as the relationship between sound and image is concerned, my perspective as a composer is not primarily, primarily concerned with the search for a correspondence between different media, but with the establishment of a contrapuntal relationship. In this relationship, temporal margins and differences between the media are also increasingly, increasingly taken into account. First, I want to take a closer look at the sound zones within a concert. Dennis Smalley has implemented Edwards Hall's theory, theories of proxemic classification as the basis of describing the sound spaces created in the performance space with instrumental music. Uh, he has divided the zones of social interaction into four different zones. These four spheres of interaction are described with spatial dimensions that have a very dynamic relationship to each other. The intimate space comprises a very close physical area. This is followed by this personal space, which is about one arm's length and describes the area of interpersonal communication. Social contact and interaction take place in the, in the social zone. The public space include, includes the widest area around us. Accordingly, Smalley describes the close sphere of action of the individual instruments as gestural space, which is characterized by the physical action and movements of the instrumentalist. The ensemble space is described as the sphere of activity of the entire ensemble and comprises the acoustic field of the ensemble and the stage space. Finally, the arena space encompasses the entire performance venue with the ensemble and the audience. This, these divisions are more or less clearly separated from each other and the dynamic, dynamic relationship of the individual sound spaces vary with the divisions of the concert space and the circumstances of the concert. 
these descriptions are suitable for an instrumental performance with a classical arrangement of so ensemble, stage, and audience. But what? Acoustic spaces arise in the concert with electroacoustic music where the loudspeakers are arranged around the audience and the performers are perhaps in the middle of the room. In my project, responsive spaces are also used mobile devices of the audience sound sources. How are the sound zones and effect zones of, the, of the, um, this situation? In this arrangement, there are sound zones that surround each, each other and are interlocked. The sound space of the arena results from a multitude of effect zones which are configured and changed depending on the listener's point of view and the nature of the space. This raises a number of interesting questions about how a constellation can be described and how it can be further thought. Which sound zones, zones arise in such a concert situation? How do, do the individual sound zones proceed? and what dynamic relationship do they stand to each other. So to examine this phenomenon, I developed a mobile setup which allows a flexible work with distributed sound and image projections. projections. Uh, this setup, setup includes a speaker system with four or more speakers, two or three projections on the local Wi-Fi network where the audience can dial in. The sounds are played back on the speaker system as well as streamed to the mobile devices or generated directly on the browser. Similarly, the visual material is projected, projected onto screens on the wall or on the mobile devices. You have a short example. Oh, there's also a performance tonight. I hope it will work. in different venues. Uh, the use of a multi-channel loudspeaker system and the inclusion of the mobile devices of the audience as sound sources results in a unique uh, listening situation that allows the spatial gesture of the music to come to the fore. On the other hand, the audience um, On the other hand, the audience could determine the volume and the direction of the sound themselves. The participation of the audience and the interaction with each other leads to the creation of a social space in the concert. The output of the image and the sound material on many different distributed uh, devices uh, is possi a possibility to make the viewer aware of his, his or her own listening and viewing position. The challenge now lies in composing works uh, with these many sound sources and visual output devices which in their complexity can also be perceived as a comprehensive 
comprehensible unit. For this task, the observation of the intermediate counterpoint proves to be useful. In the performance, five different sounds or sound types are generated. These five sound types are each assigned to five different abstract forms or movements. Through the mapping of parameters, a connection between the sound types and the visual forms are created. But these parameters are distributed with variations on every output media. I've tried to find visual correspondences for the five different sound types. Here's a translation of the sine wave. The vol volume is assigned to the brightness and amplitude, the pitch to the period to the oscillation. Here's a noise with filter. The vol volume is mapped to the brightness parameter. The position on the screen is equal to the panning of the sound. A bell sound is an additive synthesis. Um, is connected to triangle shape and a granular synthesis with a sinus tone is related to textures of squares, whereas a granular synthesis with samples is shown as fluctuating rectangles. Um, on the one hand, the mapping results in a high degree of agreement between the media. However, there are differences on every output media. They are set intentionally, but also as a result of the rarity of devices. Especially on the browser, the mobile devices, there are different forms generated. This creates an interplay of correspondences and dissonance. This can be seen as an intermediate counterpoint. The mobile devices, which are otherwise used in a very private context, will expand, it, uh, expand in the concert as a contribution to a collective experience. The private personal space enters into communication with the public collective space. Ideally, it brings the audience into a listen situation, which I call extended listening. This hearing includes not only the musical process or the perception of the audiovisual stimuli, but also an experience of the physical, acoustic and social space and an experience of the present moment, which I would interpret as a feeling of liveness. The feeling of liveness is also supported by the imperfection of the time synchronization in the reproducing of the sound. Different mobile devices have different run times and buffer times. This is an audio stream which I generate with a super collider on the laptop, a performance laptop. This uh, results in a kind of granularization and movement of sound which is composed of a multitude of individual events or time-shifted sound layers. In addition, there are differences between the output of the image on the mobile devices and the images projected in the room, as well as the intentionally designed variations and differences on each individual device. The individual shares his listening and viewing area with his immediate neighbors but also has a very individual listening area and viewing angel. The personal zone thus expands into a social experience in which the uniqueness of the moment is shared. So thank you for your attention. Okay. We'll take a couple of minutes for questions. There's one there. Thank you for an interesting presentation. Um, just to clarify, I, I think I missed this. Are you sending code to the phones to generate the sound on the phone, or are you sending uh, an audio stream to the phone? And uh, if in case, how many audio, distinct audio streams are you sending to the phones? Well, there's one, in this case, there's one audio stream uh, which I'm sending to the phone, but the visuals are generated on the phone and um, uh, the communication for uh, generating the visuals is uh, made with a uh, web socket and uh, also from out of a super collider with all these three messages. But I've also worked other projects with a web audio, but in this case, I, I stream the audio. Okay, thank you. 
Any other questions? Okay, I, I will ask one. We won't let you go to lunch early. Um, I have a question about the, the theoretical model of, about personal space. Um, in a way, it's a kind of jokey question. Having lived in different areas of the world, I have experienced different uh, uh, parameters in terms of what counts as like your personal space and, and not. So I guess it's a question about um, how flexible it would be to change that were you to put this uh, experience on in different countries in the, in the world. Uh, well, I have not, not, not the experience in that, but uh, maybe this, this is changing as well. But I think it's also interesting to, to think about uh, what, what spaces are in such a context. Uh, uh, so what, is, uh, what is the situation? Because there are overlapping spaces. I think somehow the personal space overlaps with uh, the space of the loudspeakers or the public space in that kind. Uh, and so it, this makes a, a, a kind of awareness of space. I think this uh, this would be a, I would describe of a of a interesting effect uh, what what this makes. Great, thank you. Anna, did you want to say something before yes. we break for lunch? Yes. So yeah. Well, maybe we thank Raymond once more. Yeah. And all these speakers in this session. Thank you. And also Tom, thanks. So yeah, now it's time for lunch. The lunch is provided one floor above. We, because we are a little bit delayed, but the proposal is to meet back here at 1.30, anyway. And so those were
Yes, like that. So that is the now. Feels like you better, yeah. Yeah, okay. okay. Hello, welcome to the first afternoon session. My name is Cornelia Metzig from Queen Mary University of London. I'm the chair for this session. And we welcome our first speaker, Gerard Roma from University of Huddersfield, who speaks on flexible visualization of sound collections. Thank you. Um, so, hi, so I just would like to mention that because it's a talk format, um, I think my name, but this is a lot of this is uh, in collaboration with Owen Green here and Pierre saint um within the Fluid Corpus Manipulation Project. It's a research project we all work in. Um, so I would like to start with samplers, just for the younger folk in the room. These were like uh, computers that we that we used to make music with recordings, right? We may all have forgotten about this, but they they were they had like a specialized interface, and they were kind of two schools. One more about um, playing notes and caring about the envelope and the looping point and so on, like replacing a synthesizer. And then there was the kind of MPC school, more for like between the music and mixing sounds and stuff like that. And as uh, general purpose computers started to be more uh, ubiquitous and, and available, a lot of people just replaced the samples with computers. But it's quite surprising, a bit like in the rest of music technology, how these interfaces keep living and shaping the the more popular paradigm still today, right? So one would think that a general purpose computer like this has a large screen and a lot of storage space. So we could use that um, to create better interfaces for, for uh, playing with music collections, right? And so that's a bit of the justification for visualizing collections. And of course, there's been a lot of work um, in the academia in both in, in music information retrieval uh, for trying to find metaphors to show like music collections in, in visual displays. And particularly in music creation, this kind of, this program called Cat Art has been very influential in showing how one can use a scatter plot as an interface for, in this case, for kind of granular based uh, music creation. But um, we could focus on things presented uh, at this conference. So the first year I presented this one, and it was a kind of uh, interface for querying uh, this database called Freesound for things that kind of are like loops and it could be played at kind of a similar tempo. So you would get like a few dozen samples that you could play together. And this was, um, they were displayed on a two-dimensional plane using a, a very popular library called D3 that hopefully some of you know, um, using a force layout algorithm that I will just describe. Um, and a couple of years later, um, there was another project that uh, my former colleagues Frederick Vaughan and, and Joseph Van Dera presented also making a query to Freesound and then displaying the results using a more popular and trendy algorithm called uh, TD Studio Stochastic Network Embedding, short uh, Disney. And yeah, they, they also had lots of stuff to play with the samples and so on. And then two years later, actually this morning, while I was finishing my presentation, um, another one was presented. So I thought it would be funny to mention because it was the same kind of thing. It was a, also a Disney kind of visualization. Of course, Jason said, they're not using this for the recommendation, but still, um, it's, it shows that there's interest in this kind of um, stuff for web audio. So, um, sorry. I think it'd be worth stopping and, and describing a bit how these things work. So basically, we take sounds, make like a, an analysis, a, a spectral analysis of frame by frame, 
and then we build a time series of, for each frame of a descriptor of some some thing that is perceptually relevant, or maybe not very perceptually relevant, but some descriptor of, of the sound. And then we aggregate this, we make some statistics, and we obtain like a vector a representation of a sound, and that actually gives us a high dimensional feature space for all the sounds in a collection. So this is like a two dimensional space, but with many dimensions, it's not very intuitive. So basically, it's quite common in machine learning and data analysis to use this kind of dimensionality reduction algorithms that project this high dimensional space in two dimensions or three um, for visualization, for example. And the more classical algorithms, they try to preserve um, the structure of this high dimensional space and the distances in uh, the low dimensional space. So things that should be far apart in the original space have to be far apart in the projected space. Um, but more recently, maybe as, as we increase the number of dimensions, exactly, it's more and more difficult to make sense of very high dimensional spaces. The algorithms that are really more popular actually just care about local neighborhoods. So they try to um, find places where one object is very close to other objects and actually project those into low dimensional space. And that is typically used, uh, done using a, what's called the k-nearest neighbor graph, which means that we take, uh, in this case, a sound. We look, uh, because we have this um, vector, we can compute distances. We can compute the k, for example, 15 nearest neighbors. We make connections and we create a graph, a network, in this way. And then actually, it turns out that there are already a lot of algorithms for um, visualizing graphs that exist uh, for, for graph layout algorithms. Most of them are based on uh, simulations of forces. So they will look at a sound, uh, well, an object, a node in this network as a, as a mass. And there will be like a re repulsion force between all of them. And then the connections will be like attraction forces. And you will run a simulation that eventually when it becomes stable, the sounds that, or the objects that are connected, they are close together. And the ones that are not connected are not close together. And turns out that most of the dimensionality reduction, more like machine learning based dimensionality reduction algorithms, uh, also use this kind of paradigm with more like mathematical intuition about, about the distances in the spaces, but actually the same kind of uh, mechanics. So um, this is a bit of a diversion. But we did this work, uh, this, we presented this this summer at the NIME conference where we wanted to compare some of these algorithms for kind of music creation applications. And it's quite hard to compare because they all, I mean, it's very subjective. So, for example, if we plot like a collection of drum sounds, of course the drums, they all have like natural clusters, the, the bass drums, something, and the snare drums. Uh, so you can see if, the, if these clusters appear in these visualizations, it's not the only one, but it's one of these features that these algorithms provide. And we kind of concluded that um, the older, like PCA, MDS, these are the algorithms that try to preserve the global space. The less interesting, but actually all the others, they all had some kind of interesting affordances for, for music. And from then on, the, the interest was more in the, in the other aspects, so just what parameters they have, how can we uh, tweak them to create different shapes, and how fast they are. Um, so change of subject, then um, all, these, all these things mm, allow you to create scatter plots, but um, you, could, you may want us also to, to represent sounds as something else than a point, right? So this is another project we presented last year at Web Audio Conference. It was a library for visualizing the sounds themselves. So using the descriptors, to um, the text of a descriptor to represent and to play with different colors and shapes. And this is a very flexible library that allows you to, to combine descriptors to create um, some visual representation of one sound. So the contribution of this talk is how can we put uh, both things together? And so the idea is that um, yeah, we have the frame level kind of time series uh, descriptors that uh, we can use to represent the sounds. And then we can use the statistics we compute to represent the layout. Um, and part of this is one like offline. It's, it's a bit of a negotiation. What, what can you do in the browser? Because many of these steps are expensive. And also we have like an optional step where you can actually take a long recording and convert it into a segment into a collection um, and then do all of this. And then the main challenges here are, um, well, you can see in the previous projects, for example, this one. Yes, it was using a force layout with some repulsion force, but still there's no guarantee that there's no overlap. So 
Um, and of course, if you use something like Disney, there's even less material, there's no overlap. So how can we mm, avoid these overlaps? Then even if we want to use different sizes for the sounds, for example, to represent duration or loudness with different sizes, and even different shapes. So for example, if we want to represent duration as horizontal size, then we'll have rectangles of different shapes. And the algorithms don't like this very much. So I'll just describe three, uh, three algorithms that are available for JavaScript that we can use for these kind of things. The first one is called constraints-based layout. So on paper, it looks like exactly what we need. Um, it adds the non-overlapping as explicit constraints. So it's, not, it's no longer a desirable thing. It's actually enforced. And then it tries, uh, within this constraint, to preserve the original topology of the graph. Turns out the topology of the graph is not something that we're super interested about. We only use the, the nearest neighbor's graph as a, as a means to obtain this kind of clustering and similarity, but actually it's the closeness that we're interested about, not the graph itself. So sometimes trying to optimize the shape of the graph uh, leads to results that are not so interesting. Uh, another one that is the current, like, officially trendy one is called UMAP, um, Uniform Manifold Approximation and Projection. It's based on quite uh, heavy mathematics uh, called uh, topological data analysis, but basically it ends up being yet another um, force-based layout algorithm with better mathematical uh, intuitions. And then um, interesting aspect is quite fast, and then it has at least this min minimal distance parameter that allows you to define the minimum distance between points in the final layout, which means if we don't do different shapes, if we don't do different sizes, we can still uh, prevent the overlaps. And then finally, uh, this D3 library in the version 4, they introduced a more um, elaborate uh, force directed layout, which is almost like a game engine. It's like a, a quite interesting physical simulation. But the most interesting part is that it has like a very modular interface, so you can plug and play different forces and create your own layout and by choosing different forces. And you can even write your own forces, um, although I, I still haven't had any success with that. So, yeah, hopefully we still have some time for a demo, and this, of course, is very risky, but we'll try. If the demo doesn't work, I, I have some screenshots. So here I have um, a drum, a collection of drums, um, where the color is a spectrum trait, so it represents, so the red things are um, bass drums, and the more, like, green things, I think they are uh, different rides and hi-hats. So, Is it okay? Um, so yeah, you can uh, you can see that this is using the D three force layout. You can see these quite clear clusters um, of similar sounds, um, and still kind of good at the overlap. It's not perfect. There's still some, uh, but but it's quite good. Most of the time they don't overlap. They just there's a force about, that cares about collisions, so by using this collision force, we can avoid uh, overlaps. And that what happens with this demo is that I end up losing the selector in the other um, side with this nice zoom interface. So I'll drop it and compute another one. But it takes a couple of minutes. So the constraint space layout is a lot slower. And as you will see, it. Yes, it, it, it's perfect in terms of overlap, but actually it ends up creating a more regular grid um, that loses a bit the, the, the original cluster. So you, don't, you still see areas of similarity, but, um, but I, I personally feel that I lose a bit by this kind of regular spreading of the sounds. Um, it's not so clear clustered. And then two minutes, finally, um, the UMAP one is it's kind of faster. Um, and it's, it's very good, I think, in terms of uh, both the clustering and the kind of uh, compactness. That's another parameter that is sometimes interesting to, to optimize the, the use of the space. Um, so it's, it's a very good compromise in, in terms of the clustering and the use of space. But of course, in this case, I'm using the size to represent duration. So it doesn't, you might doesn't guarantee um, that they don't overlap in this case. Um, so, to conclude, um, D3 
this is still work in progress, but so far I'm finding that um, the force, the old, good old, you know, force like that in D3 is still quite a good compromise. Um, and there's still some challenges. For example, the choice of descriptors is still is a very like um, it's fairly tricky thing. Right? You have to choose descriptors for the layout, descriptors for uh, the sounds, and they must be intuitive and at the same time good for um, representing the structure. And then, as you may have seen, uh, uh, the louder sounds and the quieter sounds, they, they're not very well differentiated. And this is because, actually, for example, these ones, and these ones, I mean, well, it's not very clear, but actually, I found some cases where there was some very quiet sounds that looked very big, and that's because the scaling actually is normalized for each of the rectangles. Like we should look into the, the general distribution of the loudness, for example, of the energy in this case, and scale each one according to the, to the, to the rest, instead of each one individually. So that's still uh, something to do. And then, yeah, so hopefully combining some of the strengths of these algorithms, we can, we can obtain uh, the best possible um, layouts. And that's all, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Jad, um, are there any questions? Can we see it online? Not at the moment. But um, as I said, it's work in progress, so there will be, there will be something, perhaps more than online, something that people can use, basically. Yeah. Other question? Sorry. Sorry, okay. Uh, for those audio spectrograms, those tiny preview images, did you also use D3 to calculate them or are they just uh, static no, images? So, so this actually this is available. This is a library we presented last year. Okay. That allows you to compute this, um, these images. It doesn't include the feature extraction. And for feature extraction, I think one of these days, uh, Luis is going to present uh, very good library for that, so I think the connection between two will give you a lot okay. of stuff to play with. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, one more question. Um, it's, it's fascinating work, thank you. Um, are you also looking then at ways of um, selecting sequences of sound, for instance, or uh, you know, like in cat art, where you might um, set up collections that you're performing back. Like, is there? A, are you thinking towards a performance interface of some kind? Yes, actually, I'm. I'm uh, playing this evening with something based on this. Um, it's very basic at the moment, but there are some sequencing and stuff going on, and so you can have a chance to see it. I think there's another question over there. Very impressive, very impressive work, thank you. Uh, the, so you mentioned in one of the slides that you are actually taking a longer recordings and then cutting them into the parts. And in this case, what was the recordings? Or it's just any kind of arbitrary recording that you can use for that? Or, or you have several samples in one recording? Or what it, what it is, really? Well, this was an optional step, actually. So this is in, uh, we work in a project where we're interested in this kind of uh, collections of sounds. That some of them they, they will be obtained from, from segmenting a, a long recording. But in this case, these demos, it was just a collection of drum sounds. There was no, but it's something, I have a program that can do that and generate this kind of visualization. Just enjoy it. Okay, one, any one No. Okay, then let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>
of all, thank you and hi everybody. Um, I'm going to show you some work uh, I did alongside José Alberto Gomes and uh, Rui Penha. Um, and that work was done in the light of Braga Media Arts and the University of Porto. Um, yeah, so let's get on to it. Uh, if you want to check it out, uh, we have uh, a website online. You know, this research is mainly focused on uh, the artistic practice. Um, and if you want to check, there's also a festival uh, in Braga called Simbrev. Um, some experimental music, some contemporary art, if you might be interested in. And uh, yeah, the basic, uh, the basic interests of this research was in computer music, contemporary media art, and collaborative interfaces. And web technologies is pretty much what wraps everything uh, with it. And this talk will be mainly and thinking about collaborative interfaces. How does that work? So. Uh, I'm in the panel of human computer interaction, <laughs> and even the paper gets uh, gets that pretty deep and how we do that um, so mainly uh, the framework we use uh, most of you must be familiar with it's node.js um, we use for graphics uh, 3.js and audio uh, also tone.js I've seen also uh, earlier some people using it and most importantly, the library, the, the library socket I.O. to establish uh, connections between people uh, from the server side to the instances, and Nexus, which is a great uh, framework. I use a lot of code from there um, and hack a little bit to make the interface. Um, yeah, and we establish everything in the Heroku platform. So, uh, of course, if, if you want to port this to Amazon or just use your own server, must be great and also something to explore uh, further. Um, it's interesting because I don't see the next slide here. <laughs> so this is the environment we did. Uh, this is Axon, uh, not the visual environment for network, network interaction and performance. So, of course, this runs in the web. This was made uh, to run in the web using the technologies I just described. And uh, if you allow me, I'll just show you a little bit of this um, so you can get how this is happening. So you, you, you load it, you have this 3D environment uh, that you can navigate with the lights you can see very well. But So you can click here and get feedback. So you click the interface, uh, everybody, uh, everybody can do this at the same time because it's, 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 uh, it works like that, but I'll come to that in the later. Uh, and then you have various scenes. These ones, if you if you can get if you can get, well, you don't see very well, but you just you just float into the scene and you have changes in the in the in the musical properties. Um, yeah, and it also accepts MIDI, uh, which is in, is is not in the paper because this is pretty much the paper is actually based on uh, the, the lower level our work has. And uh, yeah, you have also some panels. Um, um, right, this is the master, you, you don't need it. This is just a console to print sliders and faders and so on, sliders and knobs and so on. And most importantly uh, to this talk is we split this in four, uh, also based in the, in the string quartet from, from Todd Winkler, and I'll go to that in a second. So you have this main synthesizer that you click. You have this background, so you can change synthesizer. Ah, uh, see. It's the harmonics, so yeah. And then you have the background, so you can also change it. And you also have graphics. Oh, this is the first scene. Yeah, so you get it. It's, and it, you also have the post-production tab, which is some overall uh, methods for the environment where you can, where you can, you can change, such as shaders and so on. Um, yeah, and it's pretty much this. It's, it's split in four. It's, it's thought about being an environment with four instruments. 
you can look at it as one single instrument. I'm glad you look at it that way, but it's, it's thought to be, to be used this way. Um, and so how do people use it uh, collaboratively is the next part I'm going to talk about. So we implemented from scratch the interaction models from Todd Winkler. So this book, Composing Interactive Music, is actually uh, pretty, pretty straightforward and he, in a prag very pragmatic, pragmatic way. But this is it. This is the conductor model, paradigm of the symphony orchestra. This is the chamber music model, string, string quartet, and the improvisation model uh, based on the jazz combo. And as you can see, I put there four, four instances. So say you get the synthesizer, another friend of yours get the background, and then displaced in the world, you can interact um, this way. So the way we do this is we approach this in a completely centralized way. Um, so everything passes through the server, which was interesting in the experiments I'm gonna show later, uh, to record everything that was happening, and then to map with what people told us uh, about the experiments. So we have emission, we have a connection matrix, it goes through the server and then it goes to another phone. So first through the connection matrix, so because the other guy might, not, might want to be in the other model, um, so you feel free. And what we do is we gather sound data, like properties of the filters, uh, we get graphics data, like color intensity, um, we get user information, like where you are, in which model, um, and, since, and system information, like in which machine it's running, if you support WebGL, whatever. And it goes through the connection matrix, it, and this is where we define the model. So we chose, this is the synthesizer, so this is one. This is the background, this is another, so this is the way we did it. Um, this is an example of it. So an instance, the synthesizer streaming through everybody. So say you have, uh, 30 cell phones and you just want to use your computer and stream the synthesizer to all of them, it's a possibility. And then there's also the, we, we did uh, actually cut all the connections to, to make, to, for you to be able to be alone and play alone um, and nobody messing with what you're doing. And I ask here, because you have the free improvisation model also, which is interesting because, you know, as musicians we can ask, yeah, I, what is improvisation? I can be also improvising in the other models, so, which is a nice question for that. But we, ju we just added this to free them, to add freedom for the user, yeah. And um, when it comes to scale this up, uh, well, our experiments didn't go far from dozens of people, but when you, had, when you have thousands and, and millions of people, you know, a lot uh, of interfaces, whatever, uh, with or without agency, this gets pretty bad. And we also go, in the end of the article on scalability, we talk about possibilities to group people, to group uh, in the back end things and then allocate them, and then uh, people through menu or something might be able to, oh, I want to go to that one, I want to go to the other one, so um, this also might be interesting to think in a really, really large scale um, platform. So we use design-based research methodology, so the iterative process, so we did one model, we went to the field, and then we did the other model, then we went to the field, and so on. The first model was presented at Centro d'Alto Artistico, the second one in Generation Gallery, which is also part of Braga Media Arts, and the third one in Open Field Creative Lab. These were the three main uh, research experiments. And then we also presented it in Milan, in Fabrica del Vapore, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly, um, in Excoax, uh, which is the picture you have there, and currently is in Ant NTNU in uh, an installation, which is a little bit different. You don't have panels and so on. We just use the engine to make a global sound sculpture where you can connect on and, and play with. It's, it's more an artwork approach. Yeah, and so possible future work. Um, we, we say at least these five things that might be interesting in future use. So to dynamically allocate some method of the, of the graphical interface to the socket structure um, and then people who are using, being able to change it dynamically uh, might be interesting. It adds more complexity, but it also might, allow, might, might give you more freedom to, to actually make your own model um, or the way your model is structured. 
And then the study of data streaming latency on adaptive systems is always a, a valuable type of research um, for, for improvement. And then also another one interesting is to transpose this system to a completely decentralized infrastructure uh, architecture, I'm sorry, like blockchain and so on. You also have really nice um, frameworks. Um, yeah, as I said in the previous slide, automation and adaptive rules are good for large scale. And this is the last one is a little bit more uh, kind of an artistic opinion of ours, that is uh, stochastic modeling through, say, variable Mar Markov models or so on, to orchestrate um, machines without uh, deterministic induction. Um, yeah, so I think that's it. Thank you for this. You feel free to contact me, and I'll, I'll, I'll love to have a coffee with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, are there any questions? Uh, thank you very much. Um, it, it, so it interests me that you um, cited Todd Winkler's yeah. um, models um, of interaction. Um, and certainly they're very useful, but um, it seems to me that when you're obviously leading towards large scale mm -hmm. interaction. You know, within Todd's model, there's a very, <coughs> excuse me, a variation in essentially where the leadership is and how yeah. that gets shared or, or moved to a single individual in terms yeah. of the conductor. And it seems to me that when you start to work with even let's say 100 devices, yeah. then you're really starting to deal with a completely different scenario where that leadership is decentralized and perhaps even rhizomic. And so it seems to me that those models no longer apply there. And mm -hmm. so I'm wondering as you're working on that and thinking about yep. that, if you have some thing to add to that about how you think about interaction in that decentralized, yep. perhaps rhizomic model. Yeah. So uh, first of all, thank you for that question. So we've been paying a lot of attention to that actually. So. Uh, that, that's an interesting question, and I think more for the artists than for the engineering, than for the engineering part of the system, because I have reports, you know, from, from the experiments I have, from, you know, professional musicians saying, well, I don't want that person messing with what I'm doing. So uh, this is where subjectivity comes in, and the part of the first thing we do when we talk about we say when we talk about uh, scalability in this in this architecture is let's separate and give people the ability to separate from the other one from the the, the other musicians or artists whatever and but you you're you're thinking in a way when there's a thousand people um, yeah, and we can also make another kind of con uh, another kind of counting uh, and, and ask people if they want to, to, yeah, uh, yeah. It, it's, it's it's super subjective, um, and and it's interesting to 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 see. Well, even even in in jazz combo, uh, even in string quartet, you know, sometimes people are not doing what they're supposed to do <laughs> and just fly in, in their own way of, expre of expressing. But yeah, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, since uh, you mentioned you want to make things more complex and less deterministic possibly in the future, I was wondering if you considered or imp implemented any way to um, analyze multiple players' uh, activities and um, have sort of the program react to it or add some musical contribution in terms of what they're doing similar or what they're doing differently and so on, so that would have some kind of an emergent musical effect. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. That would be amazing to have and to kind of make this adaptive kind of evolutionary system. And um, no, I, I ha we haven't done that. The only, the only kind of global, uh, you know, counting, the only global data that we got from the experiments is um, like clicks and f so we can use that data and correlate with the, with the video and with the recordings that we did in the experiments. Uh, and then we also took, we made like a list with the hardware 
used in each session so you can correlate this and see, okay, this one's this way, this one's that way. Um, but yeah, to give that kind of uh, adaptability, that, that kind of, uh, to the system would be in super interesting, yeah. But, but we also get to the problem posed by the colleague that what if not everybody wants that? Um, which is interesting, but uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Any more questions? Okay, then let's thank the speaker. Thank again. you. into it. So my talk is about a quest, somewhat quixotic quest perhaps, to build a custom web audio music playback engine. And uh, so I'll start by showing you a little demo and uh, then I'll move on into sort of to explain the philosophical underpinnings of the project. Uh, the meat or the main, main part of the talk will actually be about how the engine works. And uh, I'll finish up by just uh, saying what my future intentions with this, this are and how, where I think it might lead. So I'll just start with the demo. And uh, so this is a, a player that's deployed on an artist's website directly. And at the first glance, it sort of looks like a standard media player. But you can change the playback speed or the playback rate on the fly. So you can grab the sound. Yeah. And so to summarize, so this is a web player for music. And uh, the key idea here is the arbitrary changes to the speed and direction of playback. And it's designed to be deployed as, as, a, as a custom engine for each artist. So you know, why, why did I make this? And uh, um, you know, at this point, I've been a music producer and a DJ for more than half of my life, I, I started producing music as a, as a teenager, and I spent some years on a DJ circuit. And uh, it was not long after that I got my hands on my sort of first pair of real vinyl turntables that I realized just how much the, the format of the music influences both the process of creation and also sort of the listening experience. And this becomes obvious if you follow the sort of the early works of uh, electronic dance music pioneers in the um, in, uh, 80s. And uh, their music has this sort of loopy, spirally quality to it, which you know, very often stems from, from the fact that they were using turntables and they, were, they grew up experiencing music through turntables. And the same, same thing is true for me. Uh, this, this was my first Walkman. I think I got it from when I was about nine years old and I spent thousands of hours with this thing. Uh, my favorite feature was that when the so the batteries would, would begin to, to die, the playback wouldn't stop, and you could still listen to the, to the tape and, you know, playing back slower and slower and slower. And um, that really, you know, at that age, it made me think about you know, how the music was put together. I was mostly listening to really fast, ridiculous rave music, and I didn't know how this music was made, but sort of being, uh, being able to hear it at a slower speed made me sort of fall in love with the music itself, and I think uh, this is worth, something worth thinking about because when you fast forward to today, uh, the typical way of experiencing music is through one of these three streaming platforms. And um, you know, in the internet age, this is basically a, a boomer stack by now. And um, it, it's actually 
time to maybe like move forward a little bit. And um, you know, it has large downstream effects on how we experience music. And um, uh, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I really I could do a separate presentation. But there, there's many many articles have been written of the effect of sort of the attention economy and streaming on um, on music creators, especially in niche genres. So um, you know, this is why I began to to think about you know all these websites are basically just uh, the websites. So why, why can't you just create your own Spotify or your own SoundCloud as an artist or maybe your own YouTube and um, yeah, this is basically, you can use the same tools that they, they did. Most of, most of it is all open source. So it's, it's, it might just be feasible. So I, I began to sort of um, investigate how to do it. And the typical way to play back, uh, play back sound on, on the web is through the HTML5 audio element. And unfortunately for our purposes, which is really the change of playback speed, it doesn't, doesn't quite cut it. And uh, that's because of the, it does have this playback rate property which you can set, but the range is limited. And this limitation is more or less arbitrary. And uh, the bigger problem is the lower bound, so you cannot really go lower than half the speed. And uh, another thing is that there's a pitch preserving algorithm, a time stretching algorithm in place, because I think the main use case was envisioned as listening to conference talk at slightly higher speeds if they're boring or so. And um, uh, here I have to, have to give um, kudos to the Firefox team, because they actually implemented this flag, and, uh, and it, it, it does work in Firefox, but they're the only browser. Um, so we cannot use that. So to move on, um, I had to use the WebBody API, and the typical way to play back some kind of sam samples through the WebBody API, API is to, uh, through the audio buffer source node. And this is, a, this is a pretty good API because it almost has everything that we need. So the, the playback uh, speed range or the playback rate range is actually you know, negative infinity to infinity according to the spec. <laughs> but um, uh, in practice, you cannot have, a, cannot have negative playback rates. And we need that for to have this rewind effect when you like, sort of grab the, the record and you just spin it back. And, but it's not really a problem because when you think about it, um, sort of negative playback rates are basically just a reverse buffer played forward. And um, the only thing you have to keep in mind is that the, sort of the, the offset and the remainder are, are flipped over. So you, all you need to do is to schedule the same, same buffer ahead, but with the remainder set instead of the, the offset. And um, so this is, this is good news, but it's, it's unfortunately not as simple because uh, we have we have long compositions. So typically, maybe a, a single buffer would be enough to store. I think it was designed to store 40 or 45 seconds of, of sound, but maybe you could even store a typical radio length uh, single in it, and you could adjust the playback rate as as you wish. But it's not enough because some compositions are over an hour long, right? It's been done before, and there's even compositions that are 10,000 years long. So. Imagine, imagine trying to play that back, and, and that's why you need some kind of streaming technology. Uh, so I, I had, a, had a look at these, and uh, I ended up using something like HLS. So HLS stands for HTTP Live Streaming, and it's basically just a playlist that con contains uh, chunk segments of audio. So you can define the duration of the segments. They can be maybe five seconds or ten seconds long as you wish. But that brings uh, quite unique scheduling challenges because normally it would be quite simple, right? You, you download a 10-second a chunk and then you have some time until you can download the next one and schedule it. And um, the interesting thing is sort of that uh, coming from a standard web developer perspective, uh, audio is a bit different. So, so for me, it really helped to, to think about audio as, as sort of making a plan and submitting it to the audio context, because um, you cannot just do it imperatively. Everything is running in real time, so you have to sort of schedule in advance and just like submit the plan and hope that the audio context executes it properly. And um, that, that's, the, that's the problem that we face, because when you have arbitrary changes to the playback speed, then notice what happens. For example, if you schedule a, a doubling of speed there, then you have to throw out your entire future schedule because there's just not enough time. Like the notes are going to end, then you're going to end up with a gap. So you have to create new buffers with the right speed set, 
and sort of reschedule the whole thing. And the, the audio buffer source nodes are, are sort of fire or forget, fire and forget. So you, you can schedule them to start and you can stop them, but uh, you cannot reschedule them. And uh, that becomes sort of a problem because for a, a turntable style playback, you want to keep things responsive. So you only have a few milliseconds to react and you wouldn't have time to sort of refetch the segments and create new buffers and so forth. And uh, this, this seemed like a, a quite a big, a big problem. Uh, and I have to give full credit to a, to a friend of mine here, who was a video streaming engineer, and he suggested that maybe I should have a look at some video processing techniques, because they use things like double buffering and triple buffering. So while well, one frame is still being rendered, uh, the previous one is stored in another buffer, and that's the one that's actually rendered on screen. It turns out that you can use a, a similar approach uh, for the, the audio buffer source nodes. So instead of making one, just make a bunch of them. And uh, you know, each single event that comes in that is a, a, an event that changes the playback speed of the playing node, remember we have to schedule things a bit ahead, so we're always affecting one node. In. And uh, you know, scheduling things ahead to play ahead. So you just make a bunch of them, and then you just rotate through them, and back, backfill is needed. Uh, actually, what I ended up doing is uh, sort of a triple, triple, double, double buffer, and the whole thing is twice, because you need uh, the reverse segments as well, right? Because at any point, you can just flip back. So at any point, you can just flip back and start playing backwards at, at the arbitrary speed. And, uh, you know, it, it's one thing to finally have figured this out, and and I had some kind of a working prototype implementation, but you know, it, it, it just became a giant mess. And so so um, I, 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 it was giving me so much anxiety to, to think about, you know, is my, my code at fault? Then I tried to rewrite it, tried to add more unit tests, but you know, maybe my tests are wrong, or maybe the browsers are buggy. Like, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? So I, I, didn't, I didn't know what to do. And even at some point, I developed this sort of custom debug user interface, which was just like it shows like the number of nodes that are being fired, and and just just to try to make sense of of things. But um, I started thinking about okay, like the a turntable is basically just a machine, and maybe a watch is also just a machine. So how can it be so complicated, or why is it so hard to do? And um, I began thinking about machines, machines, oh, I have to manage some state. Okay, then, oh, maybe state machines, finite state machines, what is that? So I started, started Googling, and um, I found this really cool sort of boomer technology out there. It turns out that people were extremely smart, already like 50, 60 years ago, and they have figured everything out. So you have state charts, and uh, there's, a, there's a formal system, there's papers that describe exactly how you can design a sort of systems that you, you know what kind of state they're transitioning between, and there's like this whole set of some things around it. And I ended up using a, a really cool JavaScript library called xState, and I have to say that this was the most reliable part of the, the entire code base. Like, the least re reliable part was my brain, but this <laughs> sort of state chart library was fantastic, and this is an actual state chart of the, just the scheduler part of the, of, of the engine, and there's others as well, of course, you have to fetch and buffer and, and whatnot, but they, it, it fits very nicely within this actor model of computation. Um, so unfortunately, it's not, it's not all perfect. I was, I was quite happy when, when I figured out that the implementation is possible, but um, a good test for any kind of project is to just throw a perfect loop sine wave into your um, processing pipeline and, and see what happens. And basically, at certain playback speeds, you will, you will begin to hear little clicks, little, like small, small imperfections. And uh, these happen as, at, at the edges of, uh, edges of the segments. And it's pro probably due to some, some resampling issues, because changing the playback rate is basically just resampling the audio at a different sample rate. And, uh, but because of the, the segments are ending, it doesn't, it doesn't know what continues next, and it tries, tries to interpolate some kind of frames there, but there, it's, it's, it's not going to be perfect. And in most, most cases, I think with music, I found that it's, it's, it doesn't sound too bad, but a perfect implementation would require uh, 
something using an audio workload. And essentially it's the same mechanism, but you're just picking samples and tracking the, the indices of the samples instead of the segments. So unfortunately we don't have the audio workload support in, in Safari. And uh, we also have to call out uh, Apple on this a bit because I think not many people know that all browsers on sort of iPhones, iOS devices are actually just Safari in disguise. So the engine is exactly the same and they're not playing very nicely with web audio. So that's quite unfortunate. But uh, to, to move on to the last part of the presentation and where I think it, this, this, will, this will lead us is basically, I want, to, I want you to have a look at this slide. I actually lifted this slide from another a keynote at ABC last year by Aurelius Prochatska. And I think it's very fascinating because you can see that so recording music is just an era in, in this timeline. And, and before that, we, we used to have music that, was, that had to be performed or, or executed by, by the people who, who wanted to hear it. And I think we, we still have this mindset of static recordings, whereas there's no reason for it. We have computers, there's no reason that we're still sticking to this format of three-minute singles and you know, everything based on static recordings. And uh, this is what I'm hoping to do. So actually the player is just part of a, like a bigger engine called songsling.studio that I'm working on. And I'm also developing it for my own music. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to do something more interesting here. So you see, it's, it's still the same kind of player, but the music is now composed from clips and there are log logical effects. So you have parts of the recordings like intro, outro, whatever. And watch what happens now in the bottom right corner. So it's just, the player just received brand new segments of the music on, on the fly. And it still works exactly the same as it just continues playback. And that's essentially it's the same mechanism as a turntable, but it's, it's potentially infinite and it can react in real time to online feedback. So, yeah, that's, that's about all I have. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for listening. And um, yeah, if, uh, I will I'll post the slides on, on my blog and you can also find me here, or Twitter, or whatever, wherever you need. Thank you very much. It's, it's been really fun. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Do we have time for a few quick questions? Um, my question is actually so short, I didn't need the mic. Um, will you DJ for us tonight or one of the, these nights? <laughs> it sounds I, I, really great. I do great. have a USB <laughs> stick with a my record collection on it, or some of it. So. No, it just, it sounds fabulous. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, that's, that's actually a very nice comment. Any other questions? So, so from what I heard from you, basically kind of sounds like you cannot really efficiently manipulate MP3s uh, in the browser, so they wouldn't glitch when you, like between fragments. Like you always have to, like at least now, you, you without audio workload, you will have those clicks and we will not get away from them. Uh, well, not really, because the sort of the audio buffers also they're happening on a, on, a, on a separate thread. So as long as you the thread that's not blocking the scheduling, uh, it should be fine. Yeah, but, but those issues you mentioned when we, with the sine wave that you tested with, you got I, those. No, I really think they're, they're just due to the, the playback rates being in kind of rounded up or down. And, and uh, because it, it sounds fine at one or, you know, at, at playback at one or maybe two or sort of clean multiples, it sounds fine. But when you get to these quirky uh, in between values, then I think the, so the resampler doesn't have a doesn't know what's continuing next and the segments are just chopped up and it doesn't know. I think, I think there's a way to get around this possibly by doing this complicated crossfading between uh, 
with three new buffers. But uh, yeah, I, haven't, I haven't got around to trying that yet. Thank you. OK, um, one last question over there. Thank you very much. I'm here. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, I might have lost the thread a little bit. So it seemed like just changing the playback rate kind of became one of the aims there. I might be wrong. What I'm wondering is how tricky do you think it would be to do the pitch shift or time stretching? Well, the nice thing that it's it's the web audio API, so you can pipe it in. You pipe it into the graph. So okay. of course you could have all kinds of effects. You get an EQ yeah, filtering, yeah. and actually I, I use some filtering. So when you flip over, then the low pass filter kicks in and sort of you know ducks the the high frequencies a little bit. Yeah. But uh, there's there's so much interesting stuff you can do. So cool. I think it's quite exciting, and I hope all the work on support will arrive everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. from your camp to present you some new development on, on Soundworks that is a framework that we developed at your camp since four years now. So just to give a bit of context, uh, it's something related to Nexus Hub that uh, Jesse presented this morning. There is also Rhizom by Sebastian Pickmal. I don't know if it's still something that is maintained or not. Um, it has been initially developed by uh, Sebastian Robaskiewicz and Norbert Schnell in, uh, yeah, you have the date. <laughs> and since then we had two versions in, um, yeah, two major religions. So I will just go through um, some f uh, free work that we have been developed uh, last year, almost. Uh, and um, I will focus um, on the user, which is um, not the end user, but the user that is uh, creating in his system. So an artist, a researcher, uh, composer, uh, more the expert uh, user that will use the system at the end. So that's it. Uh, so first example is a um, set of uh, small uh, application based on movement and develop using sensors on smartphones and And uh, the control interface to develop this kind of um, application is just like that. So it's quite complex. You can really create a lot of project, switch project during the application is running and stuff like that. Uh, the second one is uh, it will be weird because it's a conference. So I just cut the sound because it was too weird to have a video of a conference in a conference. But you will recognize someone in the room. Uh, but it shows the, um, one of the controller that has been developed where you can see on the right all the, all the clients that are loading sound files and there's been a lot of work made with Gav to, to create an application that is, give you just the important information you need where, while you are performing, but also that allows the composer to, to just compose. So um, it's a trade-off to, to give some openness to the system. 
Um, last example, and uh, some publicity for Garf, if you are here on Saturday, there will be a concert. Um, and last application, is, um, it is more an installation that has been made for the uh, Centre Georges Pompidou um, that is based on a big that you can see on the bottom. So it's basically each agent is a Raspberry Pi connected to a speaker, and uh, and they were hidden in the wall of the of the place, and with a proximity sensor to to trigger some global behavior of the system. There will be some an event. But that's basically what it's triggered when some somebody can close. Okay. And okay. And you can see on the bottom that's uh, a screenshot of the application where we can see the, the state of every agent in re in real time and take control over each agent and trigger some some possibilities of the system to see how, how it behaves and and have an idea of how it will behave at the end on in the in real life okay uh, so um, one of the main aspects we've seen is that uh, it's really important to maintain an agency and flow for this kind of expert user, because these tasks are mini exploratory, you would never know what you will do at the end, and the developer can take a lot of decisions and reduce the possibilities of the, of the um, user that wants to do something, actually. So I guess it has something to do with uh, cybernetics, and it's about control and monitoring. And for that, we need to create a current uh, state of the whole application. Um, so, thus we have uh, implemented new things. Um, first, the, um, the scope of the framework has been reduced a lot uh, to allow people to learn it because the Surface API was really big and really hard to remember. So now it should be easier to learn. Uh, there's no more views. And the new thing is the state management system that allows to I will do a short demo at the end. Um, so basically, that's it. A distributed system centralized over a Node.js server. Uh, the new thing is the um, fact that we can integrate uh, Node.js clients, and that's basically the same as writing a, a browser client. Um, the initialization process is the same for everybody, so yeah, it's not really interesting. And the state management system, so it's inspired by the flux uh, pattern that probably many of you know through libraries such as, such as Redux or Vuex or something like that. But it had to be adapted to take into account this distributed uh, aspect. So, um, so it's extended to the... So we have the state in the client. Uh, some events are triggered and change the state, but the state is always synchronized with the server side, and then we can do the rendering. So we have a consistent thing. We keep the consistency this way. And for that, um, we have designed a small um, you know, protocol, I would say, uh, because one of the things is if, you want, if we want to, the interesting aspect to keep this uh, state maintained over every, at least in the server, is that any 
any client can attach to the state of another client and take control over it really easily. And yeah, so as you can see, I don't, I don't have my mouse. Uh, so we have a player that can create uh, its, its own state and some controller just attach to the state and can act on the state exactly as if it was the, the creator of the state. Um, yeah, and it, that's an example. So everything is based on small schemas. And that's it. Um, okay, and let's go to the example. So, for example, uh, yeah. So here on the left, I have the controller. So I have a global, some global parameters of the applications, so, such as a master volume or mute new thing, and I can create uh, several uh, players, and this way, I don't think maybe it's small, you know, <laughs> yeah, maybe better. So we can see that uh, everyone is keeping the, the master volume quite well, but we can also take control over one particular client. There should be some. Yeah, I don't know. So no sound. Oh, because there's no sound. But I could do the same with another one. Yeah. That's it. And the um, main idea, if we look to the code, is just to this part of the code, and um, so we, we have the state manager and we can observe every state that is created by anyone on the system and choose if, I, if a player creates a state, I want to, be, I want to know about its, its state and do whatever I need to do with that. And another thing that is quite funny is that it allows to, and there's absolutely no server side code, uh, there's server side code, but it's hidden. Uh, and we can change a state, and going through, there's a new, uh, new slider for cutoff frequency, and so, so it allows to test new things really easily and rapidly, and being in a rad Rapid iteration loop. Iteration loop. Okay. And thanks. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? So we have this conversation about how sound works now that I'm not at Aircom anymore, but we can do this publicly. Um, yes, what I saw there on the screen was there was two player one, I mean there were four clients when you had the yeah. web browser open. That was four, four clients. Yeah, you can put ten if you want and you have ten. I see. But they... It's so on the left side, I have a controller where you can evoke the state of each client as you like. I didn't understand what's... Can you explain once more what's going on there? Um, okay, so in this, I could normally, for an end user, you have one client and that's all. But from the controller, I can take control over it. Uh, this thing is just to not open 10 window when you have to do something, it's all in the same window and it's kind of practical. So you just wait because it has to open socket, but then you have 10 clients. It allows to, yeah, just simplifying the development process actually. Any other questions? Uh, 
Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, so as far as I understood this, it's sort of like uh, a way to share uh, actions on some kind of state across uh, yeah, instances the, the, of a program. The whole framework is made to simplify the development of this kind of application. That's all. Take uh, doing stuff that you don't want to do each time, uh, writing a WebSocket server, blah, blah, blah. Um, and yeah, the new thing is mainly that, that kind of shared state that is completely circular. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Welcome. You? Okay. Hey, I'm here. Um, so I saw that you have a lot of uh, primitives for um, distributed audio uh, experiences. Do you also plan to work on um, providing primitives for um, visual uh, parts of these uh, experiences? Um, we have primitives that uh, at your camp that Norbert developed and yeah, but the main idea was to remove every notion of rendering because there was this view system and some pre audio primitive was in the framework before and it makes everything complicated because somebody wants to use React and other wants to use views. Last, I don't know, the next famous JavaScript framework <laughs> to do something, I don't know. And why not? And I, yeah. And it simplifies also the maintenance of the, of the framework to just <coughs> give people do what you want. It's not my problem. <laughs> okay. Um, one last question. Thank you, Benjamin. Um, just a, a couple of questions then. Um, so, is it possible then to dynamically change the player interface during performance? Like, could, could I send new interfaces at different yeah, points during yeah. performance then? Uh, this this uh, example is really made to be simple and just show, show the, um, yeah, some basic feature that I think we need in this kind of distributed thing. But after it's an application, if you want to change the, the GUI. And you could do that dynamically rather than just having the same fixed interface for the entire performance? Uh, no, you have to prepare it at some point. OK. Um, that's probably a future work because it yeah. would be really nice is to would be able to modify the schema um, dynamically because then you can just uh, maybe create your logic from uh, right. a client and it it opens up a lot of stuff then I think I'm not so, sure. so a follow on to that then would be at the moment if I understand it correctly all the players um, can also control uh, other player interfaces, is that correct? Um, if you want, yes. Yeah, so could, could you group those, or is there some way that the controller could constrain the access to everybody else from the client? Oh, that's, that's the development. In, in this case, for, for example, the clients, uh, no, they, could, they, they don't know other, uh, the player on the right don't know each other. They know the global state, but they don't know each other. They have no idea of each other. Only the controller know, knows the other. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so <laughs> okay, so now that, that's the end of the session. Um, I don't know when is, when is now the um, demo and poster session.
Thank <laughs> you.